All right, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, I know, Madeline, are you online? I am. All right. And then, Adam, are you online? I am. Okay. All right, it's uh, August 12th. We are at our regularly called meeting in the police headquarters, uh, if you will. Uh, bow your heads. Uh, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the chance that um, we get to come together. I want to specifically pray for our schools, uh, county, city, uh, all the schools that are in our city, that you are with the teachers, uh, that you are with the students, uh, that you give them a safe environment, um, but most of all that you help them not go to, to school or anything that they do where they're in fear, uh, that they know that they're protected. Uh, we have to make decisions today that uh, are beneficial to our community. I pray that you give us guidance, that you give us wisdom, and most of all, that you give us patience. Uh, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, we have a few action items. Uh, one thing I do want to add, that just to say that this is going to be under other business, we had talked about having an executive session after uh, to talk about um, emergency service response. We're going to do that under other business. So I know I'm surprising that on council members, but I think when in doubt, um, you're better to have those discussions in public, and so that's what we're going to do. Um, all right, first item, governor's local, gov the governor's local Government Support Grant. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Last month, the city received a $3.1 million state grant. Uh, we received that in July, and this grant is pretty wide open with how we can spend it, whether we use it for capital expenditures um, or supplement lost revenues. While we have the option to use these funds for operating expenses, I would suggest we instead focus the use on capital expenditures that would otherwise need to be funded out of CIP. By doing this, we'll reduce our CIP and also not use one-time funds for recurring expenses. So the suggested uses listed here in your memo surround public safety, schools, and public transportation. This includes a radio IP logger for police that will allow them to fully utilize the new radio system uh, by recording all frequencies. Funding the city's portion of the Rover bus replacement. We are um, fortunate in that our bus equipment is federally and state grant funded at 90%, so our portion is just 10%. Um, also suggest replacement of fire and re fire rescue apparatus replacements and then uh, possibly the school bus replacements. I say possibly on school bus replacements because we'll have to see what the timing is on our county shared bond proceeds. If those come in in time, we may uh, instead use those funds to make that school bus purchase. Um, so we recommend council approve these items for purchase out of this grant and I'm available if you have any questions. I just mentioned last night when I was, or a couple nights ago when I was reading this. Um, hey Rick, pull your microphone closer. <clears throat> it um, occurred to me that, I mean, my I guess my just end result of what my thoughts led to was that maybe we should wait to spend this money until we have a chance to go back through the budget in September and October. You know, as we've talked about kind of a review of once we kind of have a little bit more clarity and I know that it's been a pretty strong message from council to not spend one-time revenues on recurring expenses um, this time may be a little weird from a standpoint of I think maybe what some of this money is for is for specifically this may be one-time anomaly of the shutdown and so with this particular money I might actually be okay from a standpoint of you know, given our raises or, you know, things like that that we might would have done with operating type revenue with this money. And I think that might be kind of the essence of why we're getting the money is to cover a gap that existed <clears throat> solely due to the shutdown. Normally, we've been very uh, strong on let's don't use, mm -hmm. you know, um, this one may be a little different, though. So I guess my where I came to it in the end was, well, 
you know, and when I was looking through your dashboard, I th also kind of after I read this and it kind of made me think, well, we really only have one month's numbers is what it kind of looked like of, of true COVID numbers. Right. Um, as far as uh, tax receipts and stuff like that. And so by October, we'll have two or three months worth of, of numbers to deal with. We'll have more understanding of where we are and, and then get an idea of where, where we might use this. That'd be my my uh, thoughts on it and my preference on how to use the money, just personally. And I can understand that. The, <clears throat> the governor actually announced the grant back in January, and at that time it was um, a little less than what we ended up getting. Um, <coughs> And at that time, the intention was for capital expenses, IT, and public safety, and uh, rehabilitation of existing infrastructure to extend the useful life of those assets. Then when COVID hit, they added COVID-related expenses to the possible uses of the grant, and that was what the governor had submitted to the legislature. But you're right, the legislature came back and said, you know, we want to take away all of those limitations and allow the cities to use the funds as they deem appropriate. Um, we do have to expend or obligate the funds by June 30th, and so, you know, that's one thing that we need to keep in mind as we as we look at that. Um, the items listed before you are all items that I feel strongly will be needed in our CIP to be funded. Um, some of them, I, I don't see any problem with delaying. I do think the radio IP logger should be pushed forward so that we can get that radio system up and running and be able to fully utilize that, if at all possible. I, I'd be fine with that. Okay. What's the three, Aaron? It's communication. What's, what's the next two? The, we, the rover bus replacement. Mm -hmm. So on, on those buses, they have reached the end of their useful life. And as our fleet services continues to patch them up to keep them moving and uh, keep them on the road, we're spending about ten to 15000 extra a month on that maintenance. Um, we also have the grant funds that we need to be mindful of that we spend those in a timely fashion. On, and they have a six-month, the bus, the school, I mean, I'm sorry, the rover buses have a six-month lead time. So once we order them, it'll be you know, at least March or April, I would imagine, before we could, you know, hope to have those in-house. Um, you know, the fire apparatus equipment, that's a little bit different story, and we might be able to stretch that out, you know, a couple more months on funding that. The, um, again, they have more of a 12 to 18 month lead time on those purchases. And then the school bus, because we don't know yet about the county shared bond proceeds, mm -hmm. I'm fully comfortable with waiting, in, you know, a couple more months to see where that falls out. They have until, I think, January to make that order to have them, you know, delivered by the next school year. On the rover, mm -hmm. uh, and I apologize, I don't have my information in front of me, but the, the, the cost on, the extra cost on the rover, the ten or $15,000 a month, mm -hmm. was that for the whole fleet, or was that for whatever we're, just for the portion that we're replacing? I believe we're replacing, are we replacing the whole fleet? Yeah, the yes, we're replacing the whole months. fleet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, I want to make a comment too. Um, I appreciate the additional detail of that the COVID as a result of that was added to that because that's helpful too. But, you know, there are a couple of things. The, the sales tax <laughs> impact and the economic impact, you know, that does concern me as well, uh, knowing that you know, one of the, the thoughts associated with this money is to fill the gap for revenue shortfalls. Makes me feel like that we should be using it for revenue shortfalls. And to Rick's point, I know I've said and other council members may have said we shouldn't be using non-recurring, you know, assets for operations. But I think in this case, it was partially designed for that. The other thing is, as we're talking about, you know, the expenses on the school bus, you know, if we've got 45% distance learning, I'm not sure that there's the same priority for school bus replacements at this moment that there might be otherwise mm -hmm. just a comment um, but um, I, I just until we revisit the budget uh, which we've talked about doing I would not be in favor of using this money because especially when I mean, we've got nine more months to make this decision I don't think we have to make it right now so that's my two cents how much of it is for the the, the uh, scanner communication piece uh, the IP logger is 350,000 
That's roughly 10%. I'd be okay with that part. I mean, just for my, for what it's worth, for my piece. It's just going ahead and doing that. If you think it's, you know, it needs to really get trucking, I'd, I'd be okay with doing that. I mean, that still leaves us 2.8 of the 3.15 or whatever to, right. that we're putting a hold on. I, I'd, I'd be okay with that. <clears throat> with the communication part? Yeah, just doing that 350 piece and then so I would, hold on the rest. I would be okay with the 350 and doing rover as well. I think we... We need to make sure Rover's taken care of as well. Does it have to be paid for when you were talking about lead times? Does it have, when you say it has to be spent, it just has to be, uh, we have to say what it's going to be used for. Right, right. so with the, well, with the state grant, we have to have the funds spent or obligated by June 30th. So if we have ordered equipment but not yet paid for it, Good. it's been obligated. Um, I'm not sure, do we... <clears throat> put money down on the buses when we no okay so we just pay on delivery on those okay Madeline you got any comments about that or Bill or anybody what, what makes was the motion the amount on rover? What was the figure on one rover? point uh, one point five three four for rover? The that would be the total, you know, ten percent. So it's about a hundred and sixty thousand when we add in some um, the wrapping and stuff. One sixty one five. Yeah. All right. I'm sort of hearing every other word. Uh, my audio is not very clear at all. But no, Rick, I don't have any questions. Okay, well, I was trying to I was trying to make sure I got some input before I go out on a limb here and make a motion. It's going to get shot down. <laughs> so, but here, here's, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it anyway. How about I just make a motion that we go forward with the scanner communication piece, the IP IP scanner piece, as well as the rover bus piece that I'll. Um, and then that leaves the rest of it. So that's 150 plus 350. That's 500 that we're using of the 3.15, essentially. Oh, what, roughly. Five, roughly. Yeah. Roughly, yeah. roughly 500,000 of the 3.15. <coughs> um, so the rover is only how much then? That's 165. $160,000. Right. The local portion, the state and the federal oh, okay. make okay. up part okay. of it. That's, that's 10%. Yeah, See how that was going to replace the fleet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will, but only our part. Mm -hmm. It's very small. Yeah. Portion, okay. yeah. Both of them. So, so, so there's still how much? What's still in the kitty with the grant funds? It'd be two and a half. Roughly, yeah. Two and a half million. Two and a half. Roughly. Okay. So, I'll continue on with making that motion that we go ahead and just put a hold on the majority of this, but we go forward with the rover bus portion as well as the IP scanner portion. Okay. Second. Okay. <laughs> motion is second. Mr. Wright, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We'll now move into a rental agreement for um, renting some garbage trucks. Raymond. Good morning. Hope you find everyone well. Uh, just something uh, uh, on your agenda there to approve, of course. With COVID-19, we're experienced of uh, experienced some difficulty at solid waste. We've had, uh, I mean, Joy was back here crunching some numbers a little bit ago, but uh, looks like we've had about a thousand ton increase per month on average uh, in the in, in garbage. We had a couple of garbage trucks go down, and with COVID-19, uh, we're having a difficult time getting those parts. So we've had to rent a garbage truck to assist. And collecting the garbage so what you'll see is that rental agreement with uh, Samson equipment for your approval at $7,500 a month that is kind of opened right now still kind of open-ended we don't know how long this is going to continue uh, but we do want to be prepared to uh, to make sure that the uh, garbage is collected appropriately as it should uh, I do know that Joey had uh, ordered a new garbage truck probably about a year ago wouldn't it Joey so uh, but with obviously with COVID, it slowed down the manufacturing process. So we're hoping that what late September, something like that, is when we look for that new truck to show up. But we need to uh, obviously fill that slot. So I'm here 
you guys have any questions for us, we're glad to answer them. There aren't any. I'll move for approval. Second. Motion second. Second. Oh, we got Madeline seconded it. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Now we'll move into sanitary, sanitary sewer rehabilitation award of the contract. Sure. This, uh, this first item, uh, Council, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this was just an item based on the fact that we just bid our sanitary sewer rehab contract uh, and get, that got approved at the July board meeting. We're in the dry weather, which is the best time to get the sewer rehab work completed. So I wanted to kind of expedite your approval on this. This is all coming from our working capital reserve, so paid for effectively by cash. The uh, We only had one bidder, but the bidder has done, has been awarded about the last three contracts with us. The amount of the, the bid is $4,250,092. And uh, you can kind of see the different uh, repair and, and replacement techniques that we have uh, and the linear footages that are going along with this contract. But in essence, this re in essence, this recaptures capacity in the system that is absorbed by groundwater and uh, infiltration of rainwater. So uh, we want to spend every, every dollar spent on rehab, in my opinion, is a good dollar spent. So I'm available for questions if you have any. If no questions, I move for approval. Motion a second. Ms. Wright, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Good. All right, we'll now move into well, the benefit. Mayor, if, yep. if we could, could we move up uh, the other business item that we have yeah. so that uh, we can get an action from council and Chad can go back and Make the planes run on time. Okay. <laughs> we have a full full terminal parking lot completion. Um, Chad. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. As you know, uh, Greg McKnight has been doing an awesome job of uh, managing this project and managing the budget. And uh, we had a full uh, plan ahead of us for ultimate parking out there. Uh, we set aside a small area that had about 30 lot spots in there. In managing the budget, we were able to pull that project back into the uh, uh, project here and uh, through the use of uh, our own street department doing some of the work, we we're able to get that uh, completed around $41,345 and uh, seeking your approval. Uh, we did bid that out and uh, we saved a substantial amount by uh, really working that uh, into the project. And when you say we saved a substantial amount, we saved half, right? Yes. So it was be 82, yes. Eighty-two thousand five hundred. Yes. I went out there Saturday, and I don't know if you've been out to look at the progress out there, but it it looks really good. Yeah. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Mr. Wright, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. You can fly out of here now. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Get that. All right. We're going to move to, uh, real quickly, while we're on other business beer permits, um, you've got one um, beer, per beer permit in front of you, new ownership. Ms. Wright, does it meet all the criteria? It does, except for the building codes inspections. Okay. I move for approval. Second. Motion second. Ms. Wright, call the roll. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Any statements? No, sir. Okay. All right. We'll move to um, benefits of an automated waste management solution. <laughs> yeah, All for you, Ronnie. Yeah. Can you turn around the other way, Ronnie? <laughs> <laughs> Did you make your hair move? Uh, 
All right, Mayor, thank you, Council. Thanks for the opportunity again. Just wanted to go through um, something that we started, we initiated the process back in February, and uh, COVID has kind of delayed it. And we're not really asking for any action item or, or you know, take any action today, but wanted to kind of go through where we were and give you kind of an update uh, on this automated waste management solution. So just to kind of give you another picture of what we've been tracking this last year, the blue bars are the total number of solid waste containers in the city. That's on the left at the uh, y-axis. So you can say, see in July of 19, we were right up above 45,000, and you can see in July of 20, we're back about that same number. We had about 1,285 uh, carts get turned in. That was primarily on the commercial side. The apartment complexes and a lot of places that had, you know, 30, 40, 50 carts, they went to, to go get uh, other larger containers. We've had 1,192 new services. Um, that's going to be primarily residential. And 429 we call purchased, which is uh, those are people that need a second cart. So we're net ahead of about three. We've, we've, we've got rid of about 1,300, but we've added about 1,700. So, uh, or six, yeah, no, 1,600. So we're about 300 to the more carts than we were this time last year. Uh, this is just some pictures reminding you of some of the, the improper practices that the public has with, uh, setting, you know, blocking carts, overfilling carts. Um, this is some of the bad practices we see on the, uh, on the yard waste, uh, side of things. Um, so you can see how this, this is our, this is our knuckle boom with the clamshell. It, 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 it's difficult to pick up. We've talked about the loose grass. Uh, loose leaves. It's it's uh, takes a lot more time and effort to pick it up with that clamshell. Hedge apples. I don't know how they really picked all those up. Probably had to. I mean, we did not pick up. Probably had apples. to toss. Probably had to toss those into the back. I bet they were rolling everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So this is what we're trying to. The, the benefits of this, in, in a, br a brief three bullets, is we're trying to improve. We're trying to get better customer service. At the end of the day, we're also trying to reset the expectations of the public on how we deliver curbside services and try to uh, encourage better better practices by the public. And then uh, we were trying to gain efficiencies and, and or offset costs so that we can pay this pay the system back, that this system pays for itself. So we went, we received three proposals, one from FleetMind, one from Routeware, and one from Rubicon. Uh, you can see that the score, we had a functional Score and cost was 50%, but the other 50% was basically on functional requirements and implementation and experience and training. So we interviewed FleetMind and Routeware. Um, we just did that in July and August, so that's why I'm here. We just got through. We did virtual meetings with these two vendors, and we gave them a, we call it a demonstration script so that they just don't give us their canned presentation. We say, we want to see it do these things specific and so we require the vendor to show us how it does it so that it's kind of takes them off of their maybe their routine presentation so we got that done Raymond and I and, and Joey sat in on those uh, we do believe that Routeware is the is the top proposer um, this is kind of and I'm going to use a I can get this pointer here Um, this is what the, the driver sees in their, in their cab. And so effectively what it's got is if they've got a skip, uh, it takes a picture. They've got outboard cameras on there. They've got an, uh, internal camera to the cab. But what happens when they hit that skip, they can give a reason. It may be blocked. It just may not be out. That gets sent back within 30 seconds to two minutes, gets sent back to a centralized dispatcher at the office. So that picture is logged in. So if somebody calls in and says, you didn't pick my trash can up, they can look at that reason. There's a picture. Ma'am, sir, your car was too close or we couldn't get to it or it just wasn't out. Similarly, they get it done. There's extras. This is a kind of a customized deal. If you want to come in and say, if we do want to charge for oversized brush and limb pickup or we do want to charge for loose grass or if we do want to 
have certain things that, that we deem as an extra service beyond the standard. They can pick that, it tags it, and it sends it back to that central dispatcher and actually creates a billing code for it. So uh, the other way they can look at it, they can see the map view, but you can actually color code customers. Say if you have someone who has a disability, they can't get their cart out to the curbside, you can color code that address as green or blue, and that will notify the driver that he's going to have to get out, go retrieve that cart. And a lot of what happens when you have normal routine drivers, they know these things by heart. The big deal is, is when you have a driver out and somebody has to take over that route. They don't know that on this particular street that there's two folks that can't get the carts out to the curbside. So it really is a communication tool for alternate drivers because there's a lot of there's there's <laughs> when you look at the, the the vacation and the and the sick leave on the drivers you know we have several people out a day so there's a lot of substitute drivers having to go in and pick up routes that they don't customarily drive uh, this again this is kind of a picture of a very large you know that would be an extra if we if we change the, the, the city code city code wouldn't allow us to do it now so Oh, where did I go? Okay, the, the, this is where they got the control center uh, monitoring. You can see there's a heat map here. It shows what percent complete the drivers are on the route. If one driver had, it, they're, they're, so they're collecting GPS locations. You can set a, uh, an alert if a driver is sitting longer than three minutes or four minutes or five minutes. If he doesn't give you an, a reason, say, you know, he's at the landfill, and he's in line, well, he can hit a, he can hit a reason that he's not moving. Uh, obviously, they can see where he's at, too. But if for some instance there's an accident or there's, there's a problem with traffic, they can log it in, and, and that can explain to the dispatcher why they're not moving. But otherwise, if they're just on a normal neighborhood street and they stop for a certain amount of time, this can alert you if they're stopped for a certain amount of time. Also, what this does, it, since it, you can take that heat map and you can convert it into more of a, where they where they've picked up and what they have remaining if they have a if a truck goes down if we have a mechanical issue so that driver stops halfway through their route it creates that breadcrumb trail where he's been and then you can take all that remaining route basically circle it and assign it to another driver so uh, right now, the drivers get done when they get done. They don't necessarily all know who needs help, who doesn't, unless they're calling each other on the phone. And then it's kind of maybe a little sporadic because where have you been, where have you not been, how, how can this driver go help this driver. You can create these other routes to get everyone to complete, to completely finish at the same time, you know, roughly. So it's got a, so, and again, it's, it's web-based, it's cloud-based. Uh, it gives the dispatcher the ability to, to, when they have customer complaints, to immediately know where drivers are, to immediately know if there was a missed pickup, if there was a reason behind that, and so forth. So it has a lot of great features. Um, so the cost. I won't go through all this, but I'll just highlight that number over there in that bottom right corner. Over a five-year period, it's about $510,000. That is based on... I'll say this, that's based on a fleet of 28 vehicles. So if you take that 510, divide it by 28 vehicles, 60 months, it comes out to be about $304 per month per vehicle. Um, that, that's important. So I'm going to give you my super simple Darren Gore payback return on investment spreadsheet here in a, uh, the next slide. Uh, so if you've got 28 vehicles, $304 per month, that's about $8,500 a month is what you're paying for this system. There's an opportunity when I call go backs, and I've read a lot on this. I read a, a big report on uh, Greenville, North Carolina, uh, the uh, Winston-Salem and Raleigh area. Go backs are the big expense. If you miss somebody, hey, you've missed me, I got to come back and go get you. Even at $60 an hour, uh, which I think is pretty conservative for a, a driver and a truck. So if it takes 30 minutes to go back, you're at 30 bucks. If you if you miss and two per thousand or 0.2 percent, 
if we miss 0.2 percent and we can avoid or avoid 0.2 percent of go backs that's 10,800 bucks in avoided cost per month and a point to a two per I think waste management's goal is one per thousand all of the entities I looked at in North Carolina they were around four or five per thousand so if we're in that same ballpark four or five per thousand and we can get that down to two per thousand that avoided cost pays for itself. Um, there's also the extras. And if we wanted to go in and, and charge for unbagged grass at $5 a pop, or if we wanted to look at we charge for bulk item pickup, that 250 per month for bulk item pickup, that's a real number. That's something we've been tracking. Uh, and if you look at oversized brush and limb, if you look at 250, so some of these numbers are just I've made up. But you're looking, if, if you do start charging for those extras, you're looking at around 15000 per month potential in added revenue. So what, my whole point here is with relative conservative numbers, this thing can pay for itself back in avoided cost or additional uh, <clears throat> revenue. Now, we can go into a much more in-depth re return on invent ROI calculation. I'm sure I can get with, when we do final contract negotiations with the with Routeware, and if and, and if uh, we do select them and move forward with that contract, I'm sure they'll have a, a spreadsheet that'll go into much, much, much more detail. But this was just my simple, simple back of the napkin: Does this thing pay for itself, or doesn't? Or how difficult would it be uh, for it to pay for itself? Um, so. That's really it. Wanted to let you all know where we were in the process, that we've had a finalist selected. We think it'll pay itself back. And again, that, that's not even counting all of the customer service uh, enhancements that it will offer and the, the more efficient routing and truck driver, we'll call it our driver partnering to make sure that everything gets picked up as effectively as possible. So. All right, I got a question. Yes, sir. So there was one of the goals of this thing was to uh, sort of help educate the citizens as far as what we're what we do and you know help get them you know don't put hedge apples out there that kind of right, you know right right, right. Um, how does it help do that is it just via being more consistent on our delivery method or is it that that there's actually communication capabilities how, how does it achieve well that, that that's probably more. That's going to be, that's not necessarily going to be assist. The, the extras, if we charge for extras, that will, that will, yeah. That's, I, I hate to call it the stick method, but that, if you start charging people for loose grass and they see that they're being charged for it, then they're going to start bagging it. Well, we, had, we had a conversation about this. Uh, we in, in, in we did. And, 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 and about the, because I thought we had said, let's start charging for bulk pickup. But no, no. Do we this, just not have a methodology for doing that very well? Is that? No, well, yes. That is the thing. This thing actually docu that. documents the fact that if somebody didn't have their card out and if we had to do a go back, maybe we go back, but we charge them. Maybe we give them two or three. Maybe we give them some yeah. grace. And even on the, on the loose grass, I've talked about putting pickets in the yards to say, hey, as of this date, we're looking at charging extra for this service. Um, but this really is a platform or foundation to move towards those ordinance changes. I think... In, in, in talking about coming back just with the ordinance changes, I think we wanted to show you first, look, this is the system that really is the, is the foundation that we need before we go into those solid, wa solid waste ordinance changes. So we, those solid waste ordinance changes need to come back before you again. That may be the next round, next workshop, or a couple of months. Charging fees right now, extra, you know, Talking about charging extra fees may not be the most popular thing to do right now, but at the same time, it really has been an ongoing issue with some of the practices of our public that not charging for bulk item and not charging for large brush and limb, the, the bad grass being as a set aside issue, right. we really have the bigger, the bigger bulk item and brush and limb pickups need to be addressed. Well, one, one thing that, you know, we could do too, as far as, the, like a first step I mean if uh, a second step if this is step one um, you know a next step could be that we just start we just um, execute on the organ ordinances that already exist that were maybe not you know because I know people get used to 
you know, putting their grass out. Right. And, and isn't it already true that we're not supposed to be putting grass out? Well, no, that's it's 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 recommended in the ordinance not to do it. All right, it's no, so, there's no there's no mandate against it. But there, I know there is. At one point, we looked at even a, an exact size of the, that was the back that and, right. That was the ordinance schedule, the fee schedule that we were proposing. And I think based on the COVID hitting us, we said, hey, don't sure. push that push that off. And so wanted to show you, but we went ahead and issued the, the request for, we knew we had to have this type of auto, automated waste management solution in order to effectively implement those ordinance changes. So this is where we are, kind of, it's a kind of a, a yin and a yang here. We, we've gotten to the point where we're ready. They, they're going to hold their prices through the end of the calendar year. Because when COVID hit, we said, hey, would you guys please, can you hold your pricing through the end of the calendar year so that we can see how the economy looks and how our, um, how the budget looks. And so we're just bringing it back up to show you that if we move on forward, if it's, if, if whatever time the council feels comfortable moving forward with implementing those ordinance changes, this is kind of a, a a required piece to that puzzle to, to move forward. The way that you laid out, importantly, I mean, we could we could see the ROI come back to pay for itself without even doing any of the ordinance stuff to just be a more efficient provider of the service. I think it would pay for itself on on, on just the efficiencies without the the extra uh, fees. Even, honestly, that doesn't even you know that, that doesn't even talk about how much more efficient we are from an employer and employee standpoint right you know with being able to know hey this is what we need to be talking to people about or not talking to people about or you know or dealing with you know different of those types of issues it makes right. us more efficient as an employer as well i assume yes and, and back to the point on the education as we kind of move towards what you were talking about um, while this this system may not kick out a notice to the customer the process could. I mean, we, we would have the address, and then we could mm -hmm. mail out notices to people who have either repeat offenders on, on the garbage or loose grass pickup or something along those lines. We can get a notice out to them to help education in the meantime. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I like think it. part of it, you know, is just uh, every day the, the piece of our organization that people deal with the most is solid waste. I mean, that's – and you miss someone's – trash and you know we get phone calls on that or emails on that so I think being able to have that accountability not only to our employees um, you know I got an email yesterday about trash cans that were falling over that you know and the lady said look I'm too old to pick these trash cans up now so I mean I think us being able to have that accountability to our employees but also to the to the customers that you know if we have to go back or um, then uh, you know, I think Dana uh, Richardson was telling me the other day that he forgot to put his his uh, trash out, and that normally we run at nine o'clock in Breckenridge or nine or nine thirty in Breckenridge, and we ran at like six thirty that morning. And so he said, I, "I just missed it." You know, so you know there may be ways that we go through that we let people know. You, know, you can sign up, let people know, "Hey, we're running early." You know, today get your trash out. Or, or, or yeah. ways to do those things. I think Raymond, Raymond, they've already looked at a call out uh, a software call, especially the one of the places I just got blistered the most was on our uh, what was it Fourth of July, yeah. where where we had an alternate schedule where some people's normal pickup date was thir Friday and we went and picked it up Thursday. Whew, man, we got worn out, and so we we're looking at a at a system that will take that route. And if we can get everybody's phone number, this was, which is going to be, you know, you're. Uh, okay.
Although I would say if it's a special, if it's off, I would I would advocate that for a miss can if it was not put out on time would be something we go back charge charge. <laughs> Just saying. Well, you know, maybe we, we don't have we to. We say look, you know, it's like. <laughs> First bite free rule for a dog I, in Tennessee. You know, you're, you don't. Your first bite is free because you don't know the dog's going to bite. So if you if you leave your can out one time, then we say, hey, right. mistakes happen. But you know, yeah. That I, 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 moving forward, I think if you show the taxpayer, hey, here's how much this costs all of us. Yeah. If you know we have, if you start saying you've got a hundred cans per per. Per week that are out of forty thousand, that you got a hundred cans per week, and we're saying it costs us sixty dollars per per can. I mean, you're you're six hundred dollars per week that we're having to pay for that. Six thousand, yeah. yeah. Yeah, six thousand. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna blame. Don't correct your name, but I'm gonna blame that on COVID, like everybody else is blaming stuff on COVID. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I mean, the point yeah. is, it's yeah. a lot of money. It is 300, 300 grand a year. That coming at six o'clock. Well, I was going to say there's some there's some accountability <laughs> on the we, if we get I, I, the ordinance right now says we're not supposed to be picking up before seven, but I think we should probably move that to six, uh, just because th th this is the well the earlier they can start, the less traffic they deal with, and so they can really hit a good lick between that six and eight o'clock period. But once rush hour and traffic starts to hit. Our efficiency slows down because we're in that that that, that AM traffic. So, I, I really, the best thing to do is if we could figure out how to get them all to work from midnight until six AM. Quite honestly, no, that that you know, it was earlier. It was just the you normally pick up at nine thirty and came at six. Yeah, that's where it's yeah yeah yeah, yeah right right. The, the picture strolling of Rick, out the, there in your bathroom. The picture you know. of Rick running down the street. <laughs> yeah, at, at six o'clock in the morning. I take I take I I, I, I take back that that midnight to six AM comment. It because we would wake those things are so noisy. <laughs> we would we would we down. would we would wake everybody up. So, so. Council Member, are, are y'all? I don't think you need a motion on this. But no. Are, are we okay with letting Darren proceed? I mean, I think we've been working on this for two years now. Uh, are we are we good with letting him proceed moving this direction? I'm good. Uh, I had one question I was going to ask you. Yeah. Mentioned the solid waste goal, one percent for callbacks. Mm -hmm. Well, that was waste management. Mine, mine may be a little, but two percent, point two percent. Do you know what our callback is? Now? No, that's some. No, that's where uh, I actually just talked uh, to Joey about it, and we don't have a. We're going to have to go back and maybe try to do a little analytics on what data we've got and make make some assumptions. What I saw from the North Carolina cities was around a. 0.4 or 0.5 percent, so four or five carts per thousand, and if, that's where I kind of said, if we're there too, if we're at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and we make 0 0.2 the goal, then we we pay for it. Is it so? Just from a, I was thinking about this earlier, I think it goes to the same question: is I mean, do we get the? I have no clue how many people call dispatch per day. Is that a busy? Is that a busy thing? I mean, is it common that we're getting calls saying, hey, you missed my can? Is it, I mean, does that feel pretty common? Yeah. Yeah. So it obviously is. there's a number of them that's happening or else. That, that, right. Yeah. There's, there's, when you, because you are talking about 45,000 carts per week. So you're 180,000 pickups per month. So that's where I said, even at 0.2%, you're only you're looking at 360 for the month. I mean, if you're, if you're picking up 99.9, or 99.8 percent good I mean you need to it doesn't need to be miss you, if you're only missing 36 if you can pick up 360 callbacks a month then you're you're paying for it yeah well, we'll know that data with this program yes yes this will be this this actually does tie into city works it ties into a work order management system I mean this thing can integrate into billing software it can in, integrate into a lot of different platforms so uh, the you know, the, one of the biggest challenges is measuring stuff. If you're not measuring it, maybe, you know, you're not managing it. And if you don't have the right system in place, sometimes you just, 
I know with, with customer service and, and water resources, we didn't have the appropriate phone system to be able to measure how many dropped calls, length of calls, calls resolved on the first call. I mean, you almost have to get certain certain plat, uh, found or enterprise solutions like this in to start measuring things uh, going forward. But we'll, so we'll have to base some of this on assumption. I'm gonna proceed. Okay. Well, I, I think the next step, and I'm looking to Craig if if the next step would be to come back and revisit those ordinance uh, changes on the solid waste, or if we want to proceed. I mean, because this is a pretty firm. I mean, we can go into final contract negotiations with them. Uh, that half a million bucks is, is not going to vary that much. I wouldn't imagine. But if we don't, in tandem, move forward with the ordinance changes, um, well, we I guess we, we couldn't charge. We may not want to charge if we can. I mean, we've demonstrated that the uh, offset cost would pay for it. If we don't want to charge for extras right now, we can hold off on those ordinance changes. Yeah, I, I, there's probably two considerations. So if this, because we do have the offset cost, so if this is fine with council, we can move forward with contract negotiations and bring it to council for consideration you know, and final approval. Um, and then we can work on, on a separate track if the ordinance changes and let council decide what that might be, when it would go into effect, if there's grace periods allowed, all those kind of things. We can uh, we can pick that up as time Is this permit. CIP <clears throat> or budget? It's in the FY21 CIP, which we've not yet presented to y'all. So it's still not yet funded okay. as of right now. And it was a little heavier, it was a little front, front Once, loaded, right? It was 174 yeah. or something on the front. Yeah, one, lower down to 80 or whatever. Right. Um, the years two through five will come out of the operating budget, though. Those those will be just the annual maintenance expenses. But I, I'll tell you, my, I mean, for, for what it's worth for me, I, I would almost prefer not to tie it to the other ordinance. I mean, because either we think this is a good idea or we don't, and either we think the you know the ordinance. I mean, I think. Okay. I think doing the ordinances has to be predicated on having a system to track it. Right. I don't necessarily think having this system to be able to do all these other efficiencies and the go backs and, um, I mean, you know, because look, at the end of the day, we may decide, well, why don't we, why don't we use this system for a year to get more specifics on what do these things look like and how important is it for us to have a charge for this particular thing? I mean, right. If it comes back and says, well, there's only 17 mattress calls a year. Well, you know, maybe it's not be worth our, you know, right. worth it to do that. You know, I mean, so, right. so I, I, I'm, I'd probably be good with getting on with it. And I, I mean, I just think it's a good enough idea. I mean, this is one of those 21st century. We got to get on this, and and I got to imagine for Joey's sake and all y'all's sake on from a staff level. I mean, I know it happens where people don't get their trash out and they just call and say you missed it, and that's just frustrating as heck. I mean. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's uh, you know, it's hard not to do that, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't. When they came at six thirty the other day, I didn't call and gripe, or you know, I just dug you up. I dug down in my trash can and got stinky and took it out to the county. You know, I mean, it is what it is. But I know a lot of people don't, so I'd be willing to move on with this part of it. Okay. Help use it to get more efficient figure out some of these other things. I think it's worth it, and we get our return on investment back at least to some degree. Right. It's going to be a cheap bang for your buck at least, okay. as far as it looks to me. Understood. So, right. I, 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 it's my two cents on it. All right. I don't think we've got any other licensing statements, other business. Um, I do know we want to – we've got a presentation by uh, Chief Folks. Before, we, before I'm sorry. we do that, if I yeah. could – uh, I'd like to introduce somebody. We have a new director, our director of purchasing, um, uh, and we just hired on uh, on Monday. Uh, Paul Boyer's retiring again. Um, <laughs> not from us. He retired from somewhere, else, but he's retiring now. Um, and so we hired uh, Joe McCoy, who's here with us. And we'll introduce Joe to uh, take direction of our purchasing. Thanks. And welcome aboard, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, before Chief Folks comes up, you know, we were going to talk about some of these issues. Uh, the, the topic got brought up on 
Thursday, last Thursday, about um, EMS and, and to give y'all a, some backstory. I had lunch a week, two weeks ago, Monday, with uh, the EMA director Chris Clark, and then also uh, EMS director Carl Hudgens to talk about. You know, I felt like the council was really wanting us to reach out, and so we we had a good a good um, a good lunch and talked about several different uh, opportunities. So then when the we had the discussion on Thursday night, um, you know, or, originally we were going to hold off on that discussion. And so when that came up, um, you know, I think I thought it would be important. The proposals came back and Chief can talk about those. As elected officials, none of us have seen those in proposals, including um, including me. So that was what we were going to talk about behind under executive session. Um, but the more I talked to Craig and thought about that, I don't want anyone to think that we're trying to hide any of this information. That's not the case. There are some legal things that may not necessarily be flattering, but hey, you know, that's part of it. When we're going to talk about this, there's some good, there's some, some bad, and, um, and that's what we're all, all working on. So I asked Craig, let's just talk about it in public. And um, I don't think Craig, you may, we're not going into in-depth details on the proposals. This is for discuss, not, if y'all have questions, we can talk about those, but we didn't really advertise that we were going to be discussing this, so we can't make a decision on this, so we, we can't um, vote on this, but. Craig. Right, yeah, it's, it, we're not prepared to make a recommendation to council on what to do or who to do it with at this point in time, so that's, that's not really where we're headed, but we, but hearing what we heard from council last week and having uh, a desire to have more information, uh, what we thought we'd do is, is Mark can come up and talk about, you know, why it is we looked at um, going, going through the process we are, some of the issues that we're having, some of the things that we know that the market can provide if we do uh, alternative uh, type of service. So those are a few of the things I thought would be beneficial maybe to have council here and, and since we're open, discuss uh, if they'd like to. And I, I want to finish by saying I, I've worked on this for six years, so I know y'all know I'm passionate about it just because I've been in, in the middle of it for six years going all the way back to, I, I, I joked and said BK before Ketrin. I was working on this with Mayor Burgess, and um, this was before Chief Folks were here, was here that we were working on issues when Mr. Lyons was here. So, And when I say issues, this all goes back to 18 years ago when we started doing um, BLS and then six years ago when we started doing ALS. So I don't, I don't want anyone, the public, to think that there's any done deal or that we have anything um, personally against Rutherford County EMS. I think the men and women who work there on a daily basis are fine individuals. We may disagree on things, but just like any family members, we're not always going to agree on how we do things internally or externally. And it's not our job I had this long conversation with Mary Esther Reed today, and it's, you know, it's hard. I, I, we can't tell Smyrna how to do their stuff. Smyrna can't tell us how to do, do our stuff, and the same way goes for, for Rutherford County. But, you know, as an organization, and I think uh, I can say this for, for council members, just like Darren that's sitting here, we have charged our staff to give us the absolute best opportunities that they can to provide the best service that they possibly can to the residents of Murfreesboro. And personally, I don't think we ever want to prohibit our staff from bringing us ideas on how we can improve things. And if that hurts people's feelings on how we improve stuff, then, you know, feelings may get hurt sometimes. But look at what all we have accomplished over the last three or four years. And, and there's been things that have been painful, but um, you know, the discussions at least have to take place. So, Chief, the floor is yours. Hey, we are recording this, aren't we? Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, as Mayor McFarland mentioned, we have, we've been working through these issues for some time um, with EMS. We've been, uh, one of the things that I kind of did when I came here as the fire chief was I, I sent a survey out to all of our personnel within the department at the time. And uh, 
That survey, survey asked three questions. What are the top three things that you love the most about Murfreesboro Fire Rescue? What are the three things you like the least about Murfreesboro Fire Rescue? And if you had the ability to change one thing, the power, ability and power to change one thing, what would it be? I got a tremendous amount of feedback from those surveys, and that's the reason I did them. Is I wanted it in their words, exactly what they were experiencing and exactly what our problems were. Overwhelmingly, one of the responses on that was EMS. Um, that they wanted to be able to practice at the level of their licensure, that they wanted to be able to provide patient care at the levels that we needed to be able to. Uh, and, and we did that on that survey and, and, and kind of getting the background and history from Chief Lawson, who had been hired uh, the year before as medical services assistant, assistant chief over medical services. Uh, and the reason for that hiring was to try to get some of the issues addressed uh, with EMS and not us not being able to provide care at the utmost level that we needed to uh, for our citizens. Um, getting some background from her, I knew some things needed to change. And uh, at the time, years ago, when we started EMS 18 years ago or longer, it was actually January the 1st of 2003 that we began providing service. I think council voted it into existence in 2002, and then there was some preparation time. But when we began doing that, um, at that time, we were able to function essentially at a first aid level. Uh, even our paramedics and advanced EMTs uh, were only able to provide services at a first responder level of service. And basically, kind of almost Band-Aids, we carried no medication, uh, we did carry oxygen that we can put on people, but we had very little capabilities of providing service to our citizens. F progressing forward to 2012, council made a decision to um, go to BLS level, which was enabling us to carry some additional medications. And I'll tell you, when I looked at the medications that we talked about going to BLS level with, it wasn't a lot. I mean, it, it was giving our EMTs the ability to, to administer essentially baby aspirin and oral glucose to a patient that was a diabetic and a, it gave us the ability to check a blood sugar. It, it was in no way, uh, shape, form, or fashion giving us the ability to provide full level of services that our advanced EMTs and paramedics can. There are a cadre of medications that even an advanced EMT can deliver to a patient. Um, we knew that that needed to happen and we knew that we were missing out on saving lives uh, and, and restoring people's ability to uh, have a good well-being uh, coming, coming from a medical college because it's, it's not all the time that we're just saving lives by what we're doing on the scene. It's quality of life. It's turning around a heart attack within the first few minutes so that the person's not living with congestive heart failure for the rest of their life. And we're turning that around within the first few minutes of care. And so kind of tracking back on that, we really wanted to be able to do that. Um, when Mayor McFarland mentioned his meeting with Mayor Burgess, I think he spent two and a half hours with him going through the interlocal agreement because we were at a stalemate with EMS over letting us provide advanced EMT and paramedic level services at that time. And so that was in, that was in 2016 because I went to um, Mike Nunley, the director in March, talked to him about us providing those services in May. Uh, we had a, a big meeting and, and we agreed to uh, partner with Dr. Galloway and partner with EMS to try to make it provisions capable of us providing services at the ALS level. Whenever that happened, uh, Mayor McFarland negotiated with Mayor Burgess. I literally made the statement to, to Kim Lawson and, and Jeff Wright, who was also in the EMS division. You know, this is, this is fantastic. Two years from now, we will have a great working relationship and, you know, you'll never know that these problems existed a couple of years from now. And uh, unfortunately, I was wrong because at every level, we've hit resistance well, when it comes to Rutherford County EMS about continuing to be able to provide those skills. And so that's, that's created issues for us um, all the way down the line, whether it's not being dispatched on calls appropriately, uh, being delayed on being dispatched on calls, um, being told as soon as EMS walks in the door to stop the treatment or intervention that we're delivering to the patient at that period, at that point in time. Uh, equipment differentials, we've asked to partner with them on equipment before we purchased the cardiac monitors that we bought through the Christie Houston Foundation grant and funded partially, 60% of it was funded through Christie Houston Foundation for those monitors. Um, Jeff and his team did a tremendous amount of research on those monitors to buy the best monitors we could buy, but we also approached Rutherford County EMS and said, are you gonna be uh, getting new monitors soon? What types of monitors are you gonna be getting? Because we've got this grant, we wanna purchase these monitors, we wanna go the same direction you are, so we've got unified equipment. And, and 
you know, we were told just go ahead and buy whatever you, you intend to buy. We'll look at it whenever we're getting ready to place, which should be not that long in time. Um, so we, we don't have the we don't have equipment that marries up together. And, and we've had a lot of issues over the years that have involved, like I mentioned, everything from patient care to um, the support provided to us to, you know, our our personnel on the apparatus just feel like that they can't deliver the care that they need to deliver at the highest level possible uh, to our to our citizens. And those are all the issues that we've tried to work through. Uh, and I know that you've been told that the new leadership hasn't had time to address some of those things because we've kind of had that same thing come at us. But um, before COVID even hit, there was 10 months uh, that the new EMS director was in place. I met with him the first day that he was on the job and told him, here's the issues, here's especially patient care issues, here's our dispatch issues that we have been going through, here is, here is everything that's out here, here are the things that we need to address as as come together as agencies. I want to partner. Uh, and I told, I met with Mayor Ketron before he ever took office, uh, before, that change, before that change ever happened and let him know the issues and problems we were having. And he was committed to working those issues out. Uh, and we really went a long way toward working those issues out with coming together to agree to co-locate dispatch centers together. Uh, that was moving along very well. Um, until everything kind of fell apart in January and the county made the decision to back away from that. Um, we still feel like that co-located dispatch together with EMS would be much better than a non-co-located dispatch because the units are communicating together, they're dispatched at the same time. Uh, the issues that you have when it comes to, when it comes to not knowing about hazardous conditions, uh, an active shooter or a, an assailant on scene with a knife, those that information getting passed from one dispatch center to another doesn't always happen in an appropriate manner or a hazardous material situation or otherwise. And that's why we wanted to be in the same center with our with the dispatchers. And, and with every regard, we made all concessions that we possibly could to have them come over here to the center to locate here. Um, and like I said, they made the decision not to. Uh, but we have tried to work through issues since since last May. Um, besides the conversation that I had with Director Hudgens, we have had at least four meetings with staff from both our agency and Rutherford County EMS to address issues. Um, and additionally, our Director Wright and Director Hudgens have met individually at least twice. And I think more than that in passing conversations when they have seen each other at EMA office or otherwise about issues and what we're wanting to provide for patients. And we have literally tried in every way that we can. Um, this is not about um, some of the things that you've heard. It's, it's, we just tried for many years to do this. It's, it's not about um, us making our department larger because this proposal would not make our department larger. It's not trying to build a, a larger fire department that's doing all this stuff. It's not like that. It's, it, this is about having a tiered EMS response system, which is the standard across the country. Um, EMS is provided by fire departments across the country. Uh, it has been for many, many years. In fact, you will probably remember, or, um, old as I am, Mayor McFarland, you may not be that old, but the emergency show um, with Johnny and Roy back in the 70s, the early 70s, was a fire department-based EMS system. Uh, fire departments all over the country provide either tiered response to EMS, they do their own transport. There's many different ways to do it. And what we have tried to do over the years is partner with them in every way that we possibly could. So this is not a novel thing that we're trying to do by providing this, yet we've hit resistance at every turn um, what we, with what we have tried to do. We have the personnel, the training, uh, the licensure of our personnel and the equipment to provide very high performance EMS in our community, and we just really wanna do that. Um, and you know, there's, there's just a lot of issues, many of which I cannot tell you about in an open public meeting because it just presents a lot of liability uh, to both us and the county. But if you want to meet with myself or Chief Wright individually, I, I, this is a list of calls since last um, summer. And this is about five pages long of just responses since last summer where we've had issues that we have brought this to their attention or tried to address uh, that we can provide you. Uh, and it's, it's varying things from being canceled before anyone even arrives on scene, our response is canceled to not being dispatched on a call, to being told don't give that medication, to pulling our cardiac monitor off of a patient during a cardiac arrest. I mean, these are things that have, all things that have occurred. 
and, and all things that are very well documented that we have tried um, very much so to try to work out with EMS and that, that's what we um, that's what kind of brought us to the entire thing about looking at options and when we came to you in February if you'll remember I, we came to you a year before in February or it was in March I'm sorry uh, that we met and, and this body approved us looking at requests for competitive seal proposals. It was a year before in February that we came to this body talking about the issues and where we were at with those before the county and, and the city agreed to co-location and we tried to start working through some of those terms. Um, those just haven't, we just haven't had that and, and we, haven't, we haven't been there. And, um, and I think personally the, what we hear from them a lot is you're the fire department, we're emergency medical services, we're the ambulance service, you shouldn't be responding to emergency medical calls. Um, we just feel like that we should. Um, we feel like that we should because we have highly qualified and licensed trained personnel. Uh, in fact, 84% of our responses are medical calls uh, and we get there very quickly. And time makes the difference when you're talking about life-threatening issues that's what we want to make the difference on. And, and that's what our personnel have been trying to make a difference on for, for more than 18 years. Um, we've got 239 personnel. Um, like I said, 292% of our staff is trained, at, medically trained or are certified. Uh, and it's a job requirement that all of our staff become advanced EMTs. We've got many paramedics. We've got 21 paramedics within our department that provide care. Um, we're fully capable of doing those things. And, um, and we can provide it. So, you know, us not providing care is, and, and waiting for a fire to happen through good fire prevention and codes enforcement and the things that we've experienced over the, you know, that we've tried to do over the years to keep our community safe, we've reduced the number of fires, but we still have to have fire stations located close within our community. We still have to have the staffing. Why would we not put those personnel out responding to calls and, and saving someone's life or improving their quality of life whenever that's happening? Um, and the difficulty is EMS doesn't share that viewpoint. Uh, and and they'll, they will tell us that, or they have told us that in meetings that we have been with them, uh, that they just don't feel like we ought to be responding at all. And our, our personnel are treated accordingly. And, you know, in some cases, we are losing personnel that are very high quality personnel to other systems. We've had two, um, we've had two very good people leave and go to Nashville EMS, not the fire side. They went to Nashville um, fire department to run on emergency medical services because they want to be able to do more for patients uh, and they want to do those things and um, like I said fire departments across the United States have been providing this it's a very highly efficient way and a high quality way to get advanced level care to people uh, and it's effective very effective use of a valuable resource and we just feel like we have we have really worked um, to wit's end almost to try to establish that relationship and that partnership level with Rutherford County EMS. We have offered to have their personnel trained on our monitors that way where they're not pulling them off of. We have offered them co-location within our stations for their ambulances if they wanted to. We have offered uh, co-location here at our police department for the 911 uh, responses or the 911 calls. We have tried everything that we know to do to make this partnership work and, and we just that's why we came to the point of needing to look at other options. And so the other options that we looked at are obviously uh, the fire department doing transport on its own uh, and then looking at a request for competitive seal proposal for a, uh, essentially a public-private partnership or a public utility model uh, is what they use in some places uh, to word that. But it's a, it's a partnership between government and private entity, oftentimes nonprofits, to make it work um, to make the system better and, and to function for the delivery of emergency medical care. Uh, and that's what we did. We put those proposals out. Um, when the proposals went out, we received six proposals. Um, we, there are you know, things that I can kind of tell you about. We received six proposals. Five of those six proposals were at no cost to the city. Uh, and so those proposals came back. We felt like very good on their level of service that they provided, all of them did. Um, but the reason we put this out there was to get information on where we were at on the market, what we were looking at, and what may be out there that we could garner to provide better um, patient care to our citizens. Um, enhanced ambulance availability is something that came out through those proposals. Um, they're going to provide service with as many ambulances as we have currently have now. 
except those ambulances will be dedicated to the city. They won't be responding commonly into the county. So we'll actually have more units dedicated to the citizens of the city uh, that would be able to provide care through these, uh, through the proposals. Um, direct elevated medical direction. Uh, Dr. Galloway, Russ and Sherry are two of the finest people that I've ever met. And Dr. Galloway I know is a fantastic emergency room physician and he has been the medical director for Rutherford County EMS for years and has done a great job in that. But Dr. Galloway, he's not out on the, he's not out in the scene much. He's not out with the, the crews very much. He's not an engaged medical director like we would like to see. The reason that we went with Dr. Galloway was to try to forge that relationship with Rutherford County EMS. Um, there's kind of a different aspect of emergency medicine now. There is a, most um, emergency medicine doctors get fellowships or they get um, board certified in certain aspects. What we want to have here is a board certified emergency medical services physician that directs care of people in the field. Um, and the reason we have to have a doctor on board is because we're paramedics. And the, we function under the license of the physician. Um, and when we have taken changes over to Rutherford County EMS or to Dr. Galloway about patient care, his, his first response is to go to Rutherford County EMS and see where they're at with us providing that. And, and oftentimes we're getting the answer no, we, we're not going to let you provide that, that level of service. We just don't feel like it's imperative for you to do it or pertinent for you to do it. And uh, often the answer is no coming from those directions. And it's not based on clinical standards. It's just based on whereas most people are doing the things that we're wanting to do clinical standards-wise and standard of care-wise, it's just based on they don't want to facilitate it happening. Um, some of the... Uh, Having more clarity and consistency in patient care. The dispatch issues, if we're dispatched together with the same units, um, all of those things, all of the proposals that we had submitted back to us had were willing to come under our dispatch center to be dispatched on our radio system to purchase the radios that we're going to be operating under, um, to come onto our Motorola um, system as well as our automatic vehicle location systems where the closest unit is sent and be sent through one dispatch at the same time to, to make those things work together. And so that's, those are things that can very much so enhance patient care. It enhances communications between each other on, on scene and otherwise, and it makes things uh, go much better when communications is better. Uh, uniformity and equipment. I, I mentioned the equipment. Uh, Rutherford County just let a, they just did a bid and as far as they, they sent an email to us last week stating that they were going to be going with physio control monitors. They're doing an entire fleet replacement of monitors and going with physio control. We asked them to consider Zolex series. Um, the reason that they gave us is that, that they went to physio control is that it was going to save them about $100,000. Well, you know, and our thoughts on that are there's, there's, they're purchasing 20 monitors for that price. That's $4,000 a monitor, and those things last about 10 years. So you're talking about $4,000 per piece of equipment over a 10-year time frame where we could have been married up together and, and matched up. And the truth of it is those monitors do not have the capabilities that our monitors do when it comes to real-time CPR feedback and some other things that they do on the scene. Those monitors are still not capable of providing that level. Um, they've told us they're going to buy adapter plugs to try to make them work together on cardiac arrest victims. We tried those adapter plugs. We, we looked at them with them, uh, tried to make it work with our pads. It works for the defibrillation function, but it doesn't work for CPR feedback. It doesn't work, especially on pediatric patients. Their monitors are not even capable of, of reading that on an automated level. And so there's, there's major things going on with the monitors that just will continue to not work with ours, yet they made the decision to go that direction. Um, and so we just didn't feel like that that was, um, you know, they're, they're saying we want to work with you, we want to work with you, and we'll make some changes. At the same time, they're going a completely opposite direction when it comes to equipment. Um, even the changes that we have met together and tried to make within the last few weeks since we've had the proposal out, none of those have been enacted like we were told that they would be. Our, our paramedics and EMTs are still being told to continue discontinue treatment as soon as the paramedic walks in the door. Um, and those kind of things are still occurring on scene and, and, and they're out there. Um, training. <clears throat> One of the big things that we're seeing on, we have seen that uh, have come in with our proposals are training opportunities with the private provider that are 
that are listed in the proposals. We've had, the, the proposals are offering even to do our advanced EMT and paramedic level training for us um, within those realms. And so those, those are gonna save us a lot of money on paying those contracted classes that we have been paying uh, to have that advanced EMT and paramedic performed. Uh, it's gonna save quite a bit of money uh, annually on that. Uh, they're also providing the medical direction as part of the contract, which will save us annually uh, funds on paying for medical direction through a, through a medical director. Um, just a lot of those things are going to be, training-wise, are going to be much more enhanced going with the providers that we're looking at in the proposals. Uh, everything that they're offering training-wise would benefit us significantly, and that's something that we are just not capable of getting except by contract through Motlow State. Uh, at our current level. Some of the things with billing to collections and charity, I know that questions have arose about the way that we bill and the way that billing's done and those things are gonna be uh, happening. Both, both of the final proposals that we've kind of narrowed it down to and did interviews with um, address billing. They have both done market analysis on what current billing rates are for our area, uh, counties surrounding us, including our county. Uh, what the billings are and their billing will be consistent with those rates. It's not that they're going to come in and charge four times more than what Rutherford County charges for for ambulance service or any to those regards. Um, Medicare billing is, is is basically you either accept Medicare assignment or you don't. All of the agencies um, that submitted proposals accept Medicare billing, so there's no um, there's no balanced billing or anything like that. You can't do that under Medicare and Medicaid law. You have to accept their assignment. You accept that assignment and you're not allowed to, to go after uh, additional billings from the person that's on Medicare or Medicaid. Um, that's essentially where it's at. The, the two organizations that we're kind of down to both off finan offer financial assistance, which is a one-time component once you're on it. All that financial assistance is already in the system and you're, you're able to have everything written off uh, if you qualify for the financial assistance. And then both... Both of the agencies are nonprofits. They, they do considerable amounts of charity work. Uh, in fact, one of the proposals offered that they have are, they, their common write-off amount is about 53% of their, their billings um, is what they commonly write off. Regarding hospital transport, we've had a lot of questions about with these being hospital-based, are they gonna direct people to their facilities? Um, in EMS, that's not allowable. The patient has a choice on what hospital they're transported to within reason for an EMS system. Both of the proposals that we've had have stated that they would transport to any hospital in any county contiguous to Rutherford County and any hospital located within Rutherford County. Um, to, for any patient that's able to say, I wanna go to this hospital or the other, uh, as long as it's meeting destination guidelines. There are, there are guidelines in state law and in EMS rules that define if a person's involved in a traumatic incident that they have to go to a level one or a level two trauma center. Um, that would be the only instance that that would occur and that occurs, uh, that actually occurs now. Um, and this, this is how it's done. All the ambulance services do that. Uh, just about anywhere they will transport to a, a hospital that's in a county that's close to theirs. Um, employment opportunities. There's both of the final proposals are gonna be hiring um, anywhere from 70 to 100 people uh, to fulfill the job requirements and the needs for paramedics and EMTs within their, within their system. So we don't think that there's going to be any issues with people losing their jobs and not having jobs to go to. The market for EMS right now is there's all EMS agencies are looking for people to work. There is going to be a lot of opportunities for people to grow into those systems and do everything that they need to there. And um, the financial impact, like I said, both of these proposals have zero cost to the city. Uh, we're gonna save money on training, uh, stocking opportunities to purchase equipment and to purchase additional supplies through uh, the system that, or the provider that we would go with at a substantial savings because of the bulk rates that they purchase. Um, this will be a city directed contractual arrangement that will have performance standards within that. Um, Number of proposals, proposers uh, that we've had at six proposers indicate that it's a very strong market here and uh, that it will we'll have strong contractual appliance, compliance with what we are uh, looking for here. Um, the county, the county currently has about a $15 million EMS budget and this includes about a 1.2 in overtime 
Um, 60 to 65 percent of calls were within the city, emergency calls, uh, generating about 70 to 75 percent of their fee-based revenue. And, and that 70 to 75 percent, that also includes city-wise, that includes they have non-emergency trucks that know non-emergency calls. And so they pull that revenue in. Um, so their call for service are only about 64 percent of their total revenue. Uh, the remaining expenses are paid through taxpayer-funded uh, expenses. So that's 46% that taxpayer provided. Um, this is an opportunity if, if we choose to go public-private partnership, the EMS resizes their operation, they'll still be able to provide very good quality, excellent care uh, as a resized organization within the, within the county. Um, we would provide mutual aid to them just as we do the Rutherford County Fire um, at any time that they would need it through our provider. Uh, that would be a have to, but I, I think that they're going to have an opportunity through this to have better service in certain areas of the county that are going to reduce response times within the county and not have any more of a financial impact to the to the county budget than they currently do now um, through right sizing the organization. They can also leverage efficiencies with Rutherford County Fire. I know they're looking at co-locating a station together in the Rockville area currently. Um, to provide service out there with Rutherford County Fire that would be able to do that. And, and just kind of a review and kind of answer some of the, the questions there, the, the cost of the patient doesn't really change. We're, the billing uh, will be consistent with what we currently have. Financial assistance and charity care will be provided. Medicare and Medicaid billing are, are consistent with everything else. Um, choice of facility is always patient driven uh, and it's the closest appropriate facility if it's a, if it's a dire emergency situation. Um, anything with the contract, we would be looking at performance contracts. Of course, a, a longer term contract of five years we'll be looking at performance within that. There are standard remedies to uh, the termination of the contract if, if we're not happy with that. Um, this being a major investment for them, uh, the investment into the community um, through the proposals that we've seen range anywhere from $30 million to $75 million over the five year time frame. And with that substantial of an investment, they are going to be strongly compliant with providing the best patient care that we can possibly have. Um, and of course, other people are going to be interested in it because it's a it's a great market. We had six proposers um, submit proposals during the during the entire thing. Um, the hiring pool is going to be, I think, very good for whoever we're going to have provided. So I think employees are going to have a great opportunity. Um, and those are kind of the caveats of where I know that the things that you have seen, questions that you have had ask of you, um, purposes behind where we're at and those kind of things. Um, are there any other issues that were raised with, with you guys that we need to kind of address? Or do you all have any other questions? Let me ask you this. And I've asked this and nobody's answered this. Who decides if the service is adequate or not? Who decides if the service is adequate or not? Yep. Well, <clears throat> we go off, what we try to do is go off of clinical-based medicine and decisions there, looking at what we want to be able to provide to, to our citizens and what levels those are at. We look at what other EMS agencies are doing within the realm to say what level are we providing here versus what level are, are they providing other places and that's that's where we make the determination of how can we better serve our citizens through better patient care and some of the things that they're some of the things that have happened we have happened on scene are not happening anywhere where if you've got a chest pain patient they're waiting until we get to the ambulance to start getting a look at 12 lead or treating the patient until we get them to the ambulance we want that care delivered where the patient sits uh, and those are things that they just haven't been agreeable to I'd say we do want to look at that from the standpoint of what's best for the patient, not what other places are doing. It sounds like you said we're looking at what other places are doing to determine that's what we ought to be doing. But I would think that also that that should be a medical director. I mean, it's it sound. I think what you're asking is, don't we have a doctor who is in charge of telling us what we ought to be doing, level of care, and if that doctor is just if what you stated earlier is well he's just asking EMS what we should do and just doing whatever they say 
doesn't sound like they're doing the job that we need them to do as the medical director, and maybe we just need to be looking at a different medical director. I mean, if that's, I mean, because <clears throat> the argument that other fire departments are doing it isn't really this is what's best for the patients. That should be coming from a doctor who knows about medicine, not not me or whatever some other. Fire well, department's th doing. there's a couple levels to that though. There, there is medically what can be done for a patient at any given time on any given situation. And a doctor should drive that, obviously, and help train the paramedics to be able to provide that if they can. There's also protocols on emergency service. And so what's and, – and that's where you would go out and look at what other places are doing because what other equipment is available, what other procedures that you can put into place, those are important. Now, a lot of – medical professionals too, right? I mean, that – that's not driven by what? somebody who's not a medical professional. No, well, but right. development of equipment, you know, the, the new equipment that comes on the market, I mean, it evolves over time. And, yes, there's medical involvement into it, but it's not always just driven by a medical doctor. We could have, um, you know, a fire service with additional equipment that, that needs to come in. And, and I mean, you, you, you could have someone in an accident and, and be able to uh, have a protocol in place on how to rescue that person out of that ambulance. And part of that's medical because when you get to them, you got to do something. They may still be trapped. You still have to be able to do something. So a doctor can add information into how you would treat them, but you still have the technical part of the rescue operation that doesn't necessarily fall to a doctor. Now, as Mark said, there's emergency medical physicians now that are getting a lot more involved into what the protocols are and what equipment is available because they see it. They're out there. They do this all the time. They know what's going on. And so they would have input into to how you would develop your protocols as they go along. But I don't think there's an expectation that everything that emergency medical services provides is driven by an MD because there's also procedures that are things that have to be driven by the medical service, whether it's fire or EMS or some other service provider. But, but the point of what I think he explained hey, Rick, was... pull your microphone. Up. The point of what he had explained was providing a level of care as it relates to the health of the citizens. Right. I mean, which sounds very medical-based to me. And I, I just struggle with this whole idea that we have somebody that we pay Mm -hmm. that's supposed to be telling us the same thing that they're telling the county. And somehow there's a, you know, there's some discrepancy between the two different organizations when we have the same person that we both pay to tell us that. Now, if that is the wrong person, that he said we have to have that person in place because we can't practice mm -hmm. on, you know, we can't give health care to people without that person in place, that seems like that is a, a logical fix to me that, uh, well, that could, it, you know, it doesn't mean. It must, but tell me if I'm wrong on this, but um, it, doc, with our medical director, ultimately it doesn't re matter what our medical director says on what our staff protocol is. That has to be dictated by Rutherford County EMS. So we could say this is how we want our staff to handle a certain situation. <clears throat> But Rutherford County EM, is that correct? No, it's we can have our own medical director. There are there are fire departments that have a different medical director than the EMS provider. We could have our own medical director that could say, "You all can you all can do your protocols up to this level." Right. The problem is the handoff. If we're doing if we're doing protocols up to this level and we're handing off to a lower level of care, that doesn't work. It's just like the cardiac monitors and changing monitors out during a cardiac arrest. Is there has to be a handoff? I'm, I'm asking. I don't know the answer. Who is? Why, why is there a handoff? There's there is always traditionally. A, I mean, there's the transporting paramedic is takes the lead, and that's written into our interlocal agreement. The, the transporting paramedic typically takes the lead going in. We will ride in with them, but that's that's the paramedic on the responding ambulance. They're transporting the patient into the hospital. They're in charge of giving the patient care report. And there are cases where we may have an advanced EMT. We have to hand that off to their paramedic because we've responded with an advanced EMT. And if we initiate care, we have to hand that care, that care off to the paramedic. So even if we're able to provide this at a higher level, it doesn't work that you're, that you're handing it off and pushing it down to a lower level. The presentation sounded like we're not even able to provide care to people. As it sits right now, I mean, you made the comment, they're not letting us do this, they're not letting us do that, they're not letting us do this. 
And it sounds like we're literally not even taking care of people when they get there because they're not letting us do it. And I think we're really doing a lot of things already and we could do more without any of this stuff transpiring um, mm-hmm. that could be better care. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Look, I don't know how much we're supposed to be discussing this today. I just it's well, we can dis- we can discuss however it, it, <clears throat> because we're open. We can discuss anything that we need to discuss. But I mean, your point's well taken. I mean, if 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 the paramedic on scene, uh, the the most advanced paramedic on scene, took took the lead throughout the entire process, then um, there would have to, there'd be limited opportunities for 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 handoff. I mean, they would just the con- continuity of care would just continue all, all the way through. You know, our interlocal agreement, the way it's been done before, doesn't allow for that. And that that's one way to change it. I think the other thing is, going back to medical direction, is that right now we have a medical director that that um, really reviews things from a, from a distance. And, and that's just the way it's been. I'm not criticizing the medical director by any means, because how would I do that? But... Um, but it, it is from a distance. I mean, we've when we've had meetings with him in there, he thought things were being done that weren't even being done. So I mean, he's not really um, that that engaged on a day to day basis. And I'm not saying maybe he would be. I will tell you in the proposals that we have, there is medical direction very much engaged on a day to day basis. Some of it is is on scene when it's needed. It's virtual through technology where they're in the ambulance, they're on the scenes, they can see, they can talk just like they're there, you know, over an iPad. Um, so some of that is, and, and again, it goes back to it's no cost, but it is extremely advanced patient care from medical direction than what we have now and what doesn't seem to be progressing towards at all unless, you know, these proposals are considered. I want to make sure... As part of our interlocal agreement, we can only practice to a certain level. I mean, t- no, we're we're practicing at a paramedic level, but part of the interlocal agreement because the paramedic has to, we have to transfer care to the paramedic once right. they get there. When that happens, the care is basically turned over to them. And if we're if we have the capability of doing procedures at a higher level than they do you can't ha- you can't have that handoff and and which is required by the interlocal agreement and that has been the issue is and it and it's not just procedures that we're looking to do down the road just like we're actually doing training this month because they agreed to it finally to allow our advanced EMTs and our paramedics to obtain a 12 lead EKG on a patient when they got on scene we've had those monitors for two and a half years now that we could have been doing that a long time ago they they finally agreed to that but even when they agree to something like that in practice it doesn't happen when the paramedics first statement when they walk in the door is stop what you're doing um and i mean there there have been instances of that that i can tell you personally about or we can give you particular instances of it that i can't say in an open meeting uh, because of hipaa and because of issues with liability this is just a it's not it goes beyond just the protocols and who decides that what level of care we're going to provide it's it's the it's the issue of even if we agree clinically that this is the best thing to do for a patient and even if your medical director agrees with it if in practice and what we're seeing on the scene is a totally different attitude than that then the protocols and a medical director are going to have a difficult time come overcoming that um, and I think that's where we're at. I mean, we're one of the things I've told our people since I've been here is no matter the situation you're encountering, put the most important person in your life in that same situation and do what you would want done for them. Um, don't go above your scope of practice. Don't go above what you're doing. But I can tell you that when it comes to EMS in this community, it is not about that. It's what we have gotten from them, in my opinion, is it's a it's a turf protection or they don't want us responding to medical calls whatsoever that's their turf we're on their turf and they just don't want us going there and that's where the difficulty is we've got a philosophy of we want to do everything that we can to make the lives of our citizens better and to save lives of our citizens and their philosophy is we don't want you responding to medical calls and that's what we have heard from them time and time again in meetings the mayor and 
Does Mr. Smyrna, Tindall have heard that. Does Smyrna respond to medical calls? No, sir. Does Laverne? Laverne does. Yes. Let me ask a question, because is the real crux of the issue here that we're looking for an outside provider because we want to dictate the level of patient care? Is that is that boiled down to what we're doing? We don't is, want to dictate the level of patient care. We want to partner. I mean, contractually, I, I'm assuming that when we negotiate with these outside providers, we're going to include in that that we will we can provide uh, we can perform at the level of our licensure. Yes. Th that's part of going to be part of the contract because the issue is you put somebody else in that same situation, they may say the same thing that the emergency medical services, Rutherford County services say, listen, we've, mm -hmm. we've got this. I mean, are we going to require them to have the same equipment? Are yes. we going to require yeah. them contractually to do what we want them to do? And that, to me, is dictating the level of patient care. Yeah. We, we, ha we, uh, we ask all of them during the proposal to provide the same radios right. that we utilize to where we're on the same system utilize the same equipment that we have and that you would do that. This situation that we have here is unusual. Um, yeah. we, we typically try, most places that are working together are working together in partnership. I mean, where you have, whether it's either a contracted service or it's the county providing the service and partnering with the fire departments in that area. Sumner County EMS provides training for every one of their fire departments, even at the EMR and EMT level. Uh, to their fire departments that are up there. They they provide that. It's a it's kind of a it's in concert with each other that they provide the service. Are are they providing the providers in our uh, proposals are they doing their own building their own buildings or are they going to be located in our fire stations or what are, what are we doing? Yeah, we just like we offered for Earth for Kenny EMS to locate in our stations, their primary ambulances that will be responding will be located in our fire stations. They will be building buildings for their ambulance operations uh, personnel and centers, uh, as well as training. Yeah, training. Yeah. yeah, they're actually building a training facility and et cetera um, through those as well. I mean, there's there's several different caveats there, but we we have 11 stations that are responding that are very strategically located through our city to where we've got great response times. Do you have space in them for? Uh, yes, ambulance? we do. The only issue that we would have is storage for our reserve apparatus, which is going to be provided by the provider. It's part of the thing that we put in the request for proposal, and it's it's in there that they would provide space for our apparatus that would be displaced for an ambulance to go in. Without going into each individual proposal, can you give us sort of the highlights on what you've seen on, you know, we had a question on Thursday night, how many employees, who's, who will the employees be under? Um, how many ambulances? I mean, can you just give us a ballpark on those? Without, I mean, without naming the the proposers, but right. can you just yeah. I, I, generally, yeah, we. Okay. I think it's pretty clear. We can provide that information. Yeah, the the ambulances dedicated it range from eight to eleven, uh, depending on the proposals that are there uh, within the city that would be dedicated to within the city. And of course, they're gonna be utilizing as we advocate. You know, there's there's times in the evening hours or in the nighttime hours we drop off. So, I mean, they would they would utilize data to, to say when they're gonna staff and things like that. But I mean, the minimum that we had there was, I think six units uh, that would be providing service, if I recall correctly, uh, in the evenings or at night after midnight. We drop off significantly from midnight till about 7 or 8 a.m. Our peak call time is during the midday, and that's when they're saying they would staff up. And the two proposals that are there, are anywhere from 8 to 11 ambulances that are provided uh, throughout that system. Um, they are going to be hiring. Uh, any, I think the minimum hiring that we saw on the two proposals was 70 personnel. Um, and then one, including the administrative staff, was 120 personnel. 95 field personnel uh, was what was going to be hired by the other proposal. Um, of personnel to provide that. Again, we ask, we ask all the questions on the billing and et cetera. Um, both of the proposals that we have are going to provide continuing education for us. They're going to provide, um, they are going to provide our, have us, let us have the ability to do some training and get continuing education hours for our personnel under the same system. 
Medical direction would be provided um, with an active EMS board certified medical director who would, in conjunction with us, um, together provide that component of patient, what level of care the patient gets, what our personnel are able to do, what their personnel will do, doing all that. It, it, and, and literally, every all the wording throughout these proposals are in partnership with. It's going to be a true partnership um, that will be driven. But the, the training piece for us, the advanced EMT and paramedics, is something that kind of compounds on itself because the more paramedics that we have on our fire trucks that are providing that ALS level of care and, and all the levels that we can, you know, we're essentially four minutes away from just about any address within the city. The more that we have providing that and the more training that we can do there, the better off we are, which just compounds on itself the ability to provide better care for our citizens. And that's... Yeah, it increases... Free what? They're, they're no, they're not going to be our employees. It'll be no. a private private entity. Deal with how they get paid versus how, like, their, how their EMTs get paid versus our EMTs get paid. It, it would be no different than us working on the scene with them, with Rutherford County EMS, because they're paid at a different rate than we are, or us working a mutual aid scene with someone else. Yeah, they'll... If there's a car crash downtown and Vine Street, there's an ambulance there, are we still going to expect to send a, a fire truck with our, our personnel along with their personnel? Yes. And if we think that their personnel might that the county may come over and work for some of these new nonprofits that would be here or something like that what would be the difference why would that person necessarily change their stance on well i appreciate that the red fire truck got here first but now we're here and you need to pass that person off and really we'll be there at the same time you get here because we're stayed at, we're, we're going to be at the same spot anyway so now why do we need to send a, a truck in addition to this <clears throat> well typically on a on a life threatening or potentially life threatening that's the calls that we would go on the when you're doing emergency medical dispatch you're looking at responding to the calls that are either life threatening or potentially life threatening just about any motor vehicle accident when it's dispatched, if it's a motor vehicle accident with injuries, has the potential of being life-threatening. Additionally, there are other things that we do on the scene of motor vehicle accidents, such as um, fuel spills and oil spills and, and extrications and are, all those are kind of things. fire trucks ever going to be able to get there before the ambulance? Yes. Based at the same place? Yeah, and they won't always. They could be out on a call transporting a patient to the hospital and be out. Um, you know, if they if they run down to six or seven ambulances at night, we're going to have 11 stations responding. You're going to have six or seven of those stations that will have an ambulance in those stations. And so, you know, it's it's putting them out where they need to be out answering the calls. I had this described to me yesterday, and I guess I'll just get some clear, clarity on it as far as this employee um, status was that they were going to wear our uniforms, they were going to have all – it was going to be kind of a quasi employee. Only HR was going to be different. That's who sends them their paycheck. I don't. No. I, that's not part of the proposal. I don't know where that would have come from. It doesn't make no. that they they will belong to the private entity uh, as far as an firefighter. Well, I, I can't answer for what all firefighters say I'm because they talk I'm about all kinds of <laughs> things. But uh, but they uh, no offense, but <laughs> I think you know that too. <laughs> but. Um, it's they 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 it be it's a contractual relationship, all right. So we, we talk about partnerships. I mean, there's no real. It's not a true partnership from a legal standpoint. It's it's a contractual relationship. But that from a licensing standpoint, they need to have their own trucks. They need to be painted a certain way, and there's an advantage to that because it allows them under the licensure to be able to flex their fleet. So if there is a need, a mass incident here or a need for, for an ambulance to be able to come in and they be recognized as the same type of thing. They'll wear uniforms that, I mean, what they've said is, look, we, we can, if you want it, we can work that way a little bit, you know, get a closer appearance and stuff, but there's no reason to do that, and there's reasons not to do that. Um, but we, they won't be loaned employees to us, which is a particular legal type of relationship. They're not going to be those. They're not going to be our employees. and We're not going to have control over them. But they will follow our protocols, and they will follow our standards under contractual relationships. And so, like you're talking, if if they show up and they have they're an, a former RCMS employee, and they show up and they 
want to do something different, it's like, hey, you can't, you know, it's our protocol now. You're following our protocol, and I'm sure that most EMTs or, or uh, AMTs will understand that and take care of the patient. You know, most of them have that uh, that kind of attitude. As far as pay, I mean, there, there will be differences in pay, but ours, our, who's responding from the fire department, are also trained fire uh, firemen, and so there's a, there's a difference between working for an ambulance service, whether you're an EMT or paramedic or anything else, and working in the fire service. Um, so, you, you know, they can't go one way because they don't have fire training, but our firefighters, and that's another thing, our firefighters who want to work part-time and have the ability then to, and, and traditionally, and I don't know if they started it, I thought they'd asked at one point if they could, and we said absolutely, but RCMS never would hire. Um, they had staffing issues. Um, it's hard to hire EMS people, and yet they wouldn't hire our trained firefighters um, maybe that's changed, but they wouldn't hire them for part time, even though they need to fill those positions. So, um, they, but these entities will hire them um, and, and use them. Now, that's, that keeps their training, uh, advances their training, advancing their knowledge and experience. Uh, it gives them part time work and it develops relationships. So, we do have much more of a t- partnership type of attitude than we've had in the past. And, and when you mentioned, when you ask about, what would change if they hire an employee from Rutherford County EMS and they're answering the same calls that we are, what would change their attitude as far as that goes? I, th- I think the attitude of the organization and the design that we would be in a partnership and working together for the betterment would change the attitude of a lot of employees. And I think if they, I don't think yeah. that behavior like that would be tolerated. Right. Uh, and the majority of the, the rank and file employees, I don't think we necessarily – from talking to the firefighter union or whoever, I don't think we have issues with the rank and file employees. I don't even think we have issues with the overall structure. I, I, I think there's a different mindset between the different departments, um, you know, and, and also learning how that that hierarchy, you know, Director Clark answers to that in the city pays a, a portion of that EM, uh, EMA director salary. He, he, that position answers to the county mayor. And then, you know, there was the assumption that the EMS director answers to Director Clark, and that's not the case. I, I thought that. Um, I was quickly pointed out that by the director that he didn't answer to Director Clark, he answers to Mayor Ketron. So, you know, I, I will say, Director Clark, we've had some really good conversations with i talked to director director hudgens this morning because you know as we're throwing things out on the the table we had a a good meeting two mondays ago and you know where you have that say you're going to put everything out on the table we put everything out on the table and we had they like to say break bread so we broke bread and cussed at each other a little bit jokingly um and I thought we've got, a, you know, said, hey, here's a, a good thing that we're gonna, gonna do. But then, you know, I find out, and I, I did talk to Director Hudgens. We're gonna meet hopefully tomorrow. Director Hudgens did not feel comfortable signing the certificate of need recommendation letter for the new hospital on the west side of town for St. Thomas because St. Thomas has applied for an RFP to provide services to Murfreesboro, and you know my conversation with him and we could agree to disagree was that this is not about Rutherford County EMS and this is not about the city of Murfreesboro this is about providing health care services on the west side of town so I wrote a letter for St. Thomas but I also wrote a letter for Vanderbilt we all have friends that work at St. Thomas we all have St. Thomas has been rooted in this community for one way or another for a long time but I didn't feel like as mayor that it was my job to say we should only support St. Thomas when Vanderbilt wants to put $150 million on the west side of town, 48 hospital beds, five NICU beds. That's, you know, our job, in my opinion, is to say patient care should be at the utmost no matter who that comes from. And that's why, you know, I think Vanderbilt's going to invest. So I do think that some of the things that we're dealing with right now that, uh, unfortunately, I think feelings have been hurt and, you know, it's taken personally in some areas, and I, I want to say publicly, I, this, none of this is personal. Um, it's just on looking at what we have as a, a city and, and providing the, the best 
services. I mean, Craig, you've been in those meetings. Is that accurately sum up what we've talked about? Yeah, I know. I think it's it's accurate. It's right on point. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't I don't disagree. I, I mean, I, it, the bottom line is, what are we going to provide to citizens of our community? And, and as a secondary, I mean, we've thought about this. We've looked at it. It's not for us to say, but um, if we can take care of ourselves and not burden our city's taxpayers and allow the county to take care of the, the county, which they can improve their services out there, then it seems like a pretty good win-win situ uh, situation. But I also don't want us to be naive in this process that we say that, you know, we want to take all forms of politics out and you've got, you know, it's like saying it's Costco coming to Murfreesboro. You've got the proposals, which again, I've not seen those, but I assume we know St. Thomas put in a proposal, Vanderbilt put in a proposal, but you also have a hospital in Smyrna that's owned by HCA. And just as much as patient care is a big issue, money's a big issue with all three organizations and all three organizations compete against each other on a daily basis. So, you know, St. Thomas thinking that Vanderbilt may come in and run an outside ambulance service or HCA thinking that St. Thomas may come in and direct. There's a lot of that that's going on at the same time. So, Hey, when I asked the question earlier about the pay, the, the, I think we, we went a different direction than what I was, what I was actually asking. Uh, so I'll ask it a different way. What, what if the private company pays the EMTs more than what the fire department pays an EMT? Well, I mean, I mean, are the you think our fire department's going to our our employees will leave to go to the private company, or do we think somehow that's magically not going to happen, or is there anything in writing that says that won't happen, or, well, or I, that it won't be assumed, or uh, or whatever you want to call it that we should match whatever they're willing to pay? I mean, what? I, I don't think I don't think we we want to get involved in what they're. They're paying us, so I don't think we'd probably restrict it on a contractual basis. I mean, what the reality is, I mean, you're going to have to keep up with the market, whatever the market is. Now, they're not going to overpay people because they're going to pay people what the market is. There's a market demand for EMS. It's high right now. Um, we have to be realistic in any of our departments with anybody else as to what it is that, that we're providing, either in pay and benefits to employees. So, uh, But, there, you know, the, the tension is – they're not going to want to overpay either, and so you know they're they will it will balance itself to a, to a certain extent. Competition for ourselves immediately. No right? more than it already is. I mean, we we lose firefighters to go to to Nashville all the time because they're maybe I, I don't know what the pay situation is, but frankly, because they want to. Well, reg, we we. All the time. Right. All the time. Okay. Well, I, you know, the, the vagaries of that. We lose. We lose. Uh, lost, we've lost several. I mean, we've, we've lost four within the last year. Yeah. To and Nashville. I, and I, and it, it's not always pay, but I will tell you, from what I understand, it's because they want to go and they want to practice uh, their licensure, and they want to have because that's what when you go into fire service now, and and look, I, coming from the west, I mean, this is a model out there that this has been. It's part of where it started. It started in the west. Started in Florida. And it's gone all over the country over the last few decades. Is that fire service provides medical? Um, that's not what's happening here? It's not what's happening here, but that's what's happened every every place right, else in this country. Away. Okay, we can stay in a bubble, but we can also look at what's best handled as we go through um, the process of growing. Proposal, that's not what's happening. No, well, in this this model is not unusual for. Um, for because this is a, this is the ambulance service. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about when I was referring to is allowing oh. the medical fire service to provide medical service up to their licensure as as much as they can, and really to some extent directing how that's being done as far as name it. So now they'll have medical direction and everything else, so that it can be um, brought together pretty well um, and and advanced and. You know, I forgot my point. What were we, what were we talking about originally before you got I'm me sorry, off track? I'll cut you out. I apologize. It's my fault. No, and what? That's my fault. What Mr. Tindall was talking about, it's more tiered response. I mean, there are there are a lot of fire departments that are doing exactly what we're looking to do, which is a provide it at a tiered response to where everything meshes together. You're under the same protocols. Hopefully, you're under the same medical director. You're doing things cooperatively together, and you're able to to look at those things and give care to the best level possible. I, I just got one question, and I, I know we've got to cut this 
time short for the day. I mean, we've got another 30 minutes, but really I have two questions. One, in your opinion, Craig and um, Chief Folks, will this model be better for the residents of Murfreesboro? Yes. I think that there are a lot of advantages in this model that would be beneficial to the residents of, of Murfreesboro. Can it be handled another a different direction? Could it be handled with the county? You know, that's a potential, that's but it would take second, a it would take a lot of change. That's my second question. Yeah, it would it would take a substantial amount of change and a substantial <clears throat> amount of investment um, on on somebody's part to get to what we've seen that the marketplace will provide for the city and for our residents. So if if, if, if we feel like that this is the best model for the city of Murfreesboro, then we can talk about the details later. Do you think the possibility of going back and sitting with the county and talking about, you know, the issues that we have, talking about this is what the proposals are offering, you know, what does this mean for Rutherford County in taking dispatch aside, just looking at this is what the assets are being offered to the city of Murfreesboro at no cost. Can you get to that point at some time? And can you get and will you agree to the things that we are, are talking about on level of care with our with our first responders, can we get to that same level with you? And what's the timeline for us to be able to get to that point? Yeah, well, I think there's always an advantage to sit down and, and discuss things. Whether, you know, we can get there, I don't know. I'm somewhat reserved about that based on just the history that I understand. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile to, to have that discussion. I think it'd be a responsible thing to do. Um, I mean, yeah, I, we, we invited them to, to put in for this well, process I, to begin with. So, I, And I know, I mean, they didn't want to put in for a service that they already were providing. I mean, to, that's what they had said. But, I mean, without having a – could this be something that we could have that discussion and, you know, whether it be film that, for council members to be able to, to watch, you know, I, I think if we get more than one elected official of the same body together, that has to be advertised as a public meeting, and I don't think you're going to get the level of discussion that you would typically have when that is a a public a public meeting. So, um, I, I, I mean, I don't know if that's the, the next step is to say, here are the proposals we have. Let's sit down with Rutherford County. Let's go over what we were being offered, and at the same time, go over some, again some of the the deficiencies we think they have, but also be able to hear from them why they may say that those aren't deficiencies, and then come up with a game plan that possibly could go from there. And they may look at the proposals that we have and say, "Those are great proposals. There's no way we could ever match that. Y'all need to go that direction." I mean, they may be tired of hearing from the city of Murfreesboro, so. Are you talking about having a joint meeting well, or just I, Craig? No, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't think, I mean, I think it would be great. A joint meeting would be our staff. I don't mind going and sitting in on that meeting. And I would even say film that meeting for y'all to be able to go back and watch how that goes. I, what I was saying, I don't, I think. I don't if, think, let me, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you. I don't think that works. You've already tried that. I think you need to bring us to the table. Well, I mean, I, I don't think you're going to get the level of feedback from anyone when you have a... a I agree, but also, I just think if you have all parties at the table, we you've already had our side at the table, their side at the table, but you didn't have counsel. Well, we didn't have the proposals either. I got that, but, yeah. but you got the proposals now. Bring, bring everybody to the table. Well, Let's talk... Other. One other thing that I, I mentioned that we and, and this may this may actually either 
uh, supersede the need to do that, at least at this point or whatever. But, you know, the idea, I know that it floated around in some of my conversations with them about, you know, getting like some uh, third-party consultant to come in and talk about this whole level of care thing. And, you know, to me, you know, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, whether or not it's perfect or whatever, I, I don't know, but it, it just generally makes sense that we would hire a third-party consultant that could come in and kind of say, hey, look, the city's got kind of these set of goals, county has these set of goals. I mean, for that matter, we could bring in Smyrna, Laverne, Eagleville. You know, if, if, if they've got some goals they want to include in it, if they want to pitch in on the deal or whatever, that may convolute it too much. I don't know, but... The purpose of it would be basically to say, hey, look, um, and, and I'll use these as examples, so pardon the, the, my lack of knowledge on this, but just, and don't, I don't mean this as a suggestion, I just mean it as an example. This third party consultant comes in and says, look, I know what's going on in the whole eastern half of the United States and every daggum fire department, EMS, whatever, and here's the deal you don't need 12 point leads, you need six point leads. I'm just saying, for example, but you need these AED devices that talk to one another, and you need the ones that give you feedback on CPR in addition to just giving, C, you know, EKG feedback or whatever. And so here's what, as a county, your tiered system ought to look like. And here's where you guys go on the calls. That's where it makes sense for them to go on the calls. And then we've all got a framework to, to reference and it takes away this whole thing of we've got ownership of this little section they've got ownership of this little section we all now have this framework the county commission has a framework the ems folks have a framework to kind of go look this we know we're going to get a pretty doggone good level of care and if that matches up exactly to our proposal for example and the county is not willing to do that then we're kind of at a spot where we know, hey, this is kind of what we need to do, um, you know, and it takes out any of the history. It takes out a lot of that kind of stuff. So I know that it, it makes sense to me that we go through that process um, that would give us all a bunch of knowledge. And the reason I said it might supersede because, you know, honestly, I, I need to have zero input on whether or not we're using 12-point leads or 6-point leads or this AED or that AED. I need none of that. I don't want to think about it anymore, and I shouldn't be. So, you know, I, I want to take advice from my staff, but this this goes farther than that. If we were in our own bubble currently, and you've seen it, I mean, Darren, I make fun of what he talks about with the spinners and thrusters and all that. I kind of make fun of it as if I know anything about it. That's us acting within our own. That's not a partnership situation. Um, so, I, I, you know, I... I want to listen to all that, but it seems to me we would get somebody like that to give us some information um, to help us with. And then once we got that, we're either all at the table via knowledge or or literally. I don't know. It's just a, I'm throwing that out there. Something for us to think about. The county we we when we met the county in framework, including including Mayor Ketron, has agreed to paying for a third party review. Now I don't know how much that um, you know I've heard. From forty thousand to half a million dollars is Ooh. what the the the. I thought it was twenty thousand. That's what I'm saying. Forty thousand, twenty twenty per per. But then you know the, the the number I heard the other day was half a million dollars to do a full review of first response inside Rutherford County, and I don't think anybody's going to want to you know pay for that. So no, I, I, that's not what I'm. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about yeah. somebody who come here and look so, at the situation. So I mean, I, I think a, I think we could we could absolutely. We could absolutely do that. Then when we get that back, if, you know, Rutherford County from there says, I'm not interested in doing that, then, you know, we have our answer on how we, we move forward. Um, I, d I do think it would be beneficial to sit down with them and give them the opportunity of some of the things that we've talked about, you know, call sheets and, and some of our, you know, they've already done that. Even as much as two weeks ago, they met to go over some of the patient care issues that uh, I think – everybody agreed upon and we got we got emails back from uh, director clark and uh, you know on, on several things so i think some of that's already occurring what i was just saying kurt is that you know if we sit down with them and say they hear the proposals we have no one's seen those <coughs> except for staff 
So if they see, hey, we've got someone that's willing to put 11 ambulances inside, 11 ambulances inside the city of Murfreesboro, hire 79 people, they're going to pay for all the capital, they're going to pay for the training, they're going to build a building to house the apparatus, they may look at that and say, that's a hell of a deal, y'all need to do that. That's going to allow us to be able to provide a better service in the county than we're providing right now because we don't have to worry about the city of Murfreesboro. And that's all I'm saying, to let them look at it. And then the other option is to say, let's have the third party look at it and and, if, and then that, that could be option. And I want to be clear on this too, that, that whether it's third party or whether it's based on the proposal, you know, and, and, and I think there's a major difference. You know, what came in the proposal, I don't think I'd be willing to say at this juncture, again, not having seen the proposal, which there's another question I may, may need to ask about the proposal, but, um, you know, if it does have these things, what you've talked about, about the building, the buildings, and all that, I don't necessarily think that has to be this is what the county does or else kind of thing for me. I mean, there, yeah, no. there are other issues to this. I mean, there are things to think about as it relates to, okay, well, if this is a, a four or five year deal, that at the end of five years, if we have to rebid this thing out, the company changes who provides it. Now, all of those employees have to change their job potentially every five years. Um, you know, that's no good. I mean, our relationship with the county as a whole, this situation could create a, a much more um, more divisive uh, relationship with the county as we need to work with them on other things. That's no good. I mean, so there are some of those things that aren't, you can't place a dollar value on necessarily that will come into this discussion, no matter what the proposal say or the, th the consultant says. But at least we'd have some some objective framework if if we had that. Is is just to make sure my point is clear on that. And I, I look, I'm gonna bring this up, and I I, I questioned it. I, we got emails. I assume other people got emails too from some firefighters yesterday, um, in which they uh, brought up some details about the proposals. Um, and my immediate question was. How do they know any details about these proposals? They shouldn't know any details about the proposals. Any, just like what you said about being our, being our employees, and saying that they would wear our uniform, be our employees. These are things that you all those, talked about today. All those are conjecture. I mean, I I don't know where they would hear that. Uh, we haven't released any of the details of the proposals to our, to our staff. I have a couple of questions. I'm sorry, will you finish, Mr. Lalance? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have a couple of questions. This is a big task we're taking on if if this happens. My number one question is, what liability is the city taking on by doing this? And does our insurance cover this tremendous liability? You know, I worked in insurance uh, dealing with liability. What liability is the city taking on if we do this? Uh, okay. I'll take, I'll take a shot at and send, and Adam's on the phone so he can add on. It, it doesn't really change our liability. I mean, we, we are licensed to practice. We do practice now emergency uh, responses. And so um, from a... In, coverage standpoint, I don't believe that it changes anything because we're not changing our practices. Um, obviously, when we do a contract with someone, as opposed to the way the relationship we have in the, now with the county, but when we do a contract with someone, um, what you can do is allocate the risks in that contract. So assuring that who you contract with has the appropriate insurance and provides the appropriate identifications, you can address that, of course, a lot easier than you could if you had two governmental entities that you know, it's it's harder to okay, allocate I, liability, and there is a government tort liability act that does limit our our potential exposure. I think that's something we need to watch very closely because I cannot see uh, the city of Murfreesboro not picking up any liability at all. I I cannot see that. 
It's, and I'm not that's, talking against this. These are some questions that I have to be have settled in my mind. Uh, my second question is, I, uh, we're saying it's not going to cost the city one penny. How is that not going to cost us anything? If so, if it's not going to be any liability, not going to cost us anything, well, it's a done deal. Why not do it? Why are we going through all this? What is this going to cost the taxpayer additional, if anything? Okay, that's nothing to think about. Um, my next question is, um, as far as the meetings, I, I think it's like Mr. DeLance, and I think it was Mr. Wade, I'm not there to see, I'm just going by voices, um, was asking about the us meeting together. Things have gotten out, because I've been told some things that I've heard today, and which, you know, I think absolutely we all need to come to the table because with one uh, group of representing us come to the table, well, it bring you all bring it back to us. We have additional questions and that's just more time just dragging it. I think you all have the saying on the council, drag the can. Okay, that's just further dragging the can down the road. I think we all need to get in a room, sit at a table and address these questions that we both have. And it may be we totally come to agree, uh, in agreements with this, but we need to all be at the meeting at the same time. I, I just, I don't see a way around that. Now, as far as consultants, I'm, I'm a little anti-consultant <laughs> a little bit because number one, the money. Number two, we have hired a consultant that made big money on us that didn't even have a license, wasn't even licensed to be a consultant. So I don't know if that consultant got in on a friend of a friend of a whatever, but that consultant was hired with no license. Then when the consultant came back, and this is just my personal opinion, did not tell me one thing that I didn't know. Just came back with common sense bullet points. So I don't know if I'll be for bringing in a consultant. I might, but these are just my concerns. Ronnie, do you have something? I'm not sure I want to follow Madeline, but I will. Miss <clears throat> um, Madeline, are you finished? She's not even going to talk to uh, me. Yes, I am. And like I'm saying, I want to make it clear. I'm not for or against it. But these are some of the things that I need answers to, not necessarily satisfactory answers. I just need truthful answers to. And then I'll be good. Um, I think there's been a lot of stuff talked about, and, and as probably the newest member of the council, most of this is new to me. So, you know, since my time on the council, I have not heard a whole lot about this. One, just a couple observations. One thing that sticks out to me, um, you know, the timing of this discussion and, you know, really the, the seriousness of our concern associated with the level of care that, you know, Mercer Fire and Rescue can provide. You know, in some ways it feels like we should have had this conversation before we did an RFP that I feel like I didn't know some of this. Um, the mayor may have known, Craig may have known, the chief may have known, but I certainly did not know. Um, so that's concerning, uh, both in the timing of when, how this was done, when it was done, that concerns me. Um, one of the things I will say is, uh, you know, it's hard to know exactly the landscape of this thing. I can certainly see how the county EMS program uh, probably has tried to hold us back a little bit. That makes some logical sense to me. Um, that doesn't feel very good. I think I understand why they might want to do that from a turf stand standpoint. I understand why, you know, our, our firefighters want to practice at the highest level they can. I think I, if, I, if I was in that job, I think I'd want to do the same thing. So I get that as well. Um, there's some things that worry me um, that, you know, we're not talking about, which is, um, you know, I, I, I'm an elected city official, but I also live in the county. And I'm a county resident as well. 
And so whatever we do with the bucket of money of revenue from transport fees we pull from the county is going to create a hole. And there's been a lot of assumption I've heard by everybody that says this is what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen, whatever. I don't think anybody in here knows what's going to happen. And so the problem is I live in the county. That's a problem I'm going to have to deal with at some point. I may be making a decision as a council member that has a negative impact on the county, and I have no idea what that decision is going to do, really. We can speculate on that, but I don't know what it's going to do. That troubles me. Um, it also troubles me that we're talking about um, not talking about in public something that is we feel like is serious enough that, you know, patient care is, is potentially jeopardized. <laughs> And we think it's okay for us in the city to uh, make a decision about what's best for Murfreesboro without thinking about what's best for the rest of the county. So my point in that is if there's an issue with the county, we should absolutely be talking about not, not just for the city, for everybody in the county. And so from the standpoint of getting everybody together, let's get everybody together. And if people don't want to have that conversation, I'm sorry. I mean, let's fix the problem. But handing our bucket of revenue to the county because we don't like what they're doing and how they're doing it and they won't let us do what we want to do feels like we're saying you guys worry about yourself we're going to take care of the city of murfreesboro we're not worried about everybody else so i do have a concern about that um i'm concerned that we'd be making a decision that we don't really understand um you know i'm pretty sure some of my county tax dollars like we just talked about are being paid to subsidize ems they're going to give those back probably not well, we're going to give them back to them as a city. I mean, I, I don't want my dollars to just go into some other pit in um, the, the county trough because now we're pulling the county, the city core transport dollars out and giving them to a private provider. I, you know, we may have to fix that, that funding gap. I, I just don't know. And so, you know, it, it's um, – I don't want to lose sight of the fact that I, I do feel like – you know, Chief, you, I feel like you've worked hard to try to do the right thing. You know, um, I'm not sure tell them they can't use our training session as center is the right thing. But that part aside, I think we've tried to do the right thing about that. And I think we should continue to do the right thing about that. Um, and I know it's tough and I'm not there having to have the conversations and being frustrated because folks aren't doing what they say they're going to do. I, I know that's hard. But I think we need to keep having this conversation. And, and I don't think... Um, we need to say or set the precedent that, hey, in Murfreesboro, our level of care is at such that the county standards don't meet it, and we're not worried about Smyrna and Laverne and Eagleville, uh, so y'all can do your thing, and we're just going to make sure that our folks get the best care. I, I just don't know that I'm comfortable with that, and that's all I know. So. Craig, I think what would be good if everyone would agree to this, I'm totally fine having – I mean, if, if I – if I'd say if we were worried about not – having these conversations um, publicly, we wouldn't have done this today. We would have just, you know, gone back and had gotten the information presented to us and not had this discussion. I am completely fine for um, us to invite Mayor Ketron and Director Hudgens to come and answer. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that we initially advocated for um, – Overall, the, the, the municipalities between Smyrna, Laverne, and Murfreesboro are the majority of calls that EMS responds to in Rutherford County. And really, those municipi municipalities, besides their county commissioners, don't have really a say in, in how that care is provided. We, you know, so one of the things that we initially talked about, and the municipal mayors really agreed, not only... Um, there's a memorandum of understanding that the Smyrna attorney have prepared that's going to be coming to us on the emergency management director salary that, you know, we need to be notified when, you know, what we didn't, as a municipality, we're paying for a portion of that position salary. And as a municipality, we didn't even know what the, what the position paid, um, you, you know, so we're trying to budget for a position that we didn't even know what the new director made. Um, so there is the thought of having Mayor Ketcher and, and Director Hudgens to answer these que you know, answer questions that we have for them because, I mean, I mean, I hate to be this way. We're their largest customer. The city of Murfreesboro is their largest revenue and their largest 
um, call volume. So if their largest, I mean, in my business, if my largest customer has got concerns with the service I'm providing, you can better bet that I'm going to listen to what my largest customer has to say. So I, I think it'd be very appropriate that we invite um, Mayor Ketron and and uh, and, and uh, Director Hudgens to come and let's let's talk through these things. And so that way you guys can ask the questions and, and hear, you know, some of the answers and we'll have our data put together. And if there's, you know, data that we need to talk about, about how Narcan was issued to a, a patient and how we were going to do the Narcan and how they decided to do the Narcan, then I think we throw that on the table and say, here's some of the issues we're having. We're not going to talk about specific patients, but here's where a cardiac monitor has been pulled off and yours has been put on. And this is why we don't think that's right. And as council members, we can get educated and we can get those answers and we can see if there's something we can work through. Um, Let's do it. Y'all feel comfortable with that? Yes, I think that's a good idea, but could we also include our medical director, Dr. Absolutely. Galloway? Yeah. I yeah. think that would be appropriate that we could ask the same questions because the intent was that that would bring us together and there's some questions that I think. Yeah, well, and everybody's accountable at that point. Yeah. I mean, that's what's important. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I was saying overall, I think one of the things that we really wanted to talk about moving forward is that there is a public safety commission, but you know, there is not an avenue right now for the municipalities really to be able collectively to have these discussions uh, in more of a, a board type. I mean, there's a, you know, Mr. Smith's here and I know Mr. Smith, we need to invite you to make sure you're at that, that meeting that we have also. Um, but, you know, there's there's a 911 board. There's several different layers um, that we have representation on, but there's not really an avenue where, as municipalities, we have these discussions together. So, you know, I I, I would invite Mary Esther and and Jason and Chad and let them sit in the audience so they can hear those discussions that we're having. I mean, I do can 100% say from talking to Mayor Reed, they do not prov provide medical care in Smyrna because something issues that were many years ago under the past regime but there that's something she said that they are going to talk about so i think there are there are there's opportunities to have those discussions so i mean maybe craig in the next two or three weeks schedule something that's here in this room and um i mean there's all kinds of things i've been watching on tv with uh, Senate hearing so it can be like a Senate hearing that we can but we need to let them a answer questions as, as opposed to filibusting can Reclaim I, your time I, reclaim your time. Can I ask if can uh, I reclaim my time? It's my time Rick <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding uh, go ahead <laughs> <laughs> That's how most of them look anyway yeah, isn't it? Yeah. What yeah. Um, so I, You know again, I, I'm a I'm a little I'm okay with it. I'll come to the meeting. I don't want to be the ones I don't know that we should be the ones really talking about seven point leads and 12 point leads and all that necessarily. I, I certainly will listen to some of that and I'll be glad to sit here and listen to how people talk about it and converse about it that should be talking about it. Um, but, you know, does that mean the county commission ought to be here for their sake? I mean, as it relates I, I mean, to they're going to be the ones voting on if they're, I mean, because, you know, at the end of the day, if they got to come up with more funding, the county commission's got to vote on it. Well, I think, right? I, yeah. I think we could invite um, Chairman Reed with the Public Safety Commission because anything that comes has got to go to the Public Safety Commission. So, you know, we could invite Chairman Reed and then have Director Director Hudgens and, and Mayor Ketron. And, you know, I don't think it'd be practical to get all 21 members of the plan, County, yeah, County Commission here. But I, I wonder if it's practical for all seven of us to be here. I mean, frankly, I'd sit it out if, it, you know, again, my whole hope has always been from sitting here at this table, however many months ago it was now, that whatever the avenue is to get it worked out, that it gets worked out. And the very last avenue <laughs> would be I'm sitting at the table talking about 12-point leads. I mean, the very last avenue. So I, if we're here, I mean, I, I'm glad to come to the meeting. Uh, Shane, I'm, Mayor well, McCoy, I, I'm, I'm glad to come to the meeting. If that's the way the rest of the council wants it, I'll show up, okay? so. Well, I think we, we, we need to have, we'll have staff prepare a list of questions for us that y'all, everybody can look over that you may want to add things to the, and y'all may want to get some background on some of the things that we've been talking about for the last four or five years. And y'all may want to ask the questions and, and you get a background and, um, you know, sort of maybe, I mean, as, as an elected official, we always get the best of staff members. 
you know, y'all know that the complaints that we get sometimes about people who deal with individuals inside the city, we, we I'm like, well, man, what are you talking about? I never see that. And it's because we always get the best. But um, so, I mean, I suspect that what we'll get, we're going to get Rutherford County's best. But I think y'all asking questions and I'll ask questions and, you know, that that lets them know here's what we'd like to see. I don't think that can hurt. I think it's a good idea, Kurt. The one thing that won't be, look, I thought you were done. Didn't well, you I'm going to tell you, the one thing that up? won't be, the one thing that won't be satisfied as far as my my concerns as it relates to that is a an objective look at this level of care situation and that seems to be so much of the crux i mean i can already kind of see you know I'm, I'm writing down some remedies here i can already see there are some remedies to so many of these issues and I, you know i've had meetings with director clark director hudgens i had one with him months ago but you know i've i've had some meetings uh with Mayor Ketron to try to get myself informed and try to understand more about this and all that kind of stuff. I, I just really don't want to necessarily be extending the, well, we say this and they say this and we say this. I, I, I'm not going to know whether or not it's appropriate to use a 12 point lead or a six point lead during that meeting, the same as I don't know if it's appropriate now. <clears throat> and I really don't want to sit through necessarily learning the reasons for why it is or isn't. Um, and trying to make some determination on that for myself. But I mean, I think we can have our staff prepare us some simple questions that, you know, we can all educate ourselves on in the next two or three weeks. And I mean, a simple question is, are you against our um, first responders uh, performing at their highest licensure that they have? Yes or no? If you say yes. Maybe it would be, are you against us getting our own medical director? Yeah, I mean, I you think know, those. I think those I mean, that work together. Yeah. I think that settles. I mean, to me, if we have our own medical director, we already have paramedics. We already have EMTs. Now we got our own medical director that says this is what you can or can't do, and what you should or shouldn't do, and that's it. We go do, and so all the whole object, the whole objection of we they say we can't do this or they say we can't do that is completely gone. But you still have some issues though. Get Even some if other we issues. have our own medical director, yeah. there's still other issues. Yeah. That but they get, but what? we're getting so much still, smaller. And, and look, here, here's the thing. And I told somebody this yesterday, and, and I, I, I think it's important for our staff, or maybe for me to say this to all you guys while we're sitting here. If, if they are starting to make changes, which I think you mentioned a couple that they have recently made, and we know that they are trying to work towards some of the changes, whether they get to where we want to be, I don't know. But if our answer is always, yeah, but, yeah, but they used to not, or yeah, but yeah. we're worried about this, or yeah, but this, or yeah, but that, it makes it look like we're the ones who are not willing to cooperate. You know, if they're making changes to try to come towards us and we're going, well, yeah, but that's not enough, or yeah, but that's, we, you know, they should have done it earlier. I mean, we, I, and I'm not saying because you just reminded me of that. That really came from the other night. Um, but, you know, we have to be careful about that as it relates to how we go about this process, is my opinion on that, and that we do need to give them some time uh, to make some more. Sorry. Your time is up. I yield the gentleman, Wade. Mark, Mark. You yield the fuller? Now he yields to the gentleman from the Blackman community. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so are we done yet talking about EMS? I, I have one thing to bring up. Yeah, his time's up. Okay, good. All right. The gentleman from Blackman is recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, Your time's I, up. I need... Uh, um, can I have a motion for adjournment, please? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. I need um, Councilman Shacklett to give us an overview of uh, what happened last night at the... Um, school board meeting because we need a little bit of clarification. I got calls, I got emails and texts about this, and I think Bill can give us a little bit more clarity on what's going on. Thank you. <laughs> the the you gym. have one minute. Yeah. That's because it's, it's not, not going to be enough. Me long enough. Don't let that roll, gentleman, ball start rolling. The gentleman off Jones Boulevard is recognized. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll try to do this quickly, but and we found ourselves in this position too is uh, – you know, you kind of get, you don't know exactly where you're going and you can't find the process kind of defeats the purpose of what we tried to, tried to accomplish last night. 
I didn't had uh, didn't have the right comments. Wish I could have thought of what I did this morning to recommend last night. Uh, you know, when there is a, a struggle to try to find consensus going forward, uh, at least a, a three of the members of the school board last night did not know about a motion that was going to be made at the first of the meeting, which uh, made it difficult. That's basically sunshine laws. We were not able to understand and, and share with each other what we're going to do before we do it. Uh, and so that motion was made. And then the, the body had to try to s decide what was the most responsible uh, way to go forward. And there was a lot of struggle there uh, because people were trying to, on the fly, figure out what to do. And I think the evidence of the struggle was the, there are at least two, four to three votes that were made by the, uh, uh, by the board. And uh, I think what the result kind of did what I thought was probably the most appropriate thing to do. I, I, I wish I had thought to make the recommendation that we defer the vote and, and then allow some of the questions that were raised during the midst of the discussion to be asked because there were uh, points that were raised in the discussion that no one really had an answer to. Are they required uh, a longer answer than, than what was appropriate at that, in that meeting? And the compulsion was to get to a decision. And so they got to a decision. And, uh, you know, I, I think what the most important thing to say, uh, make note of, is that, you know, our schools are in steady hands. We've had a good opening of our schools. I think, is Gary not here anymore? But I would, I would tell you that uh, our schools have opened safely, and they're doing a remarkable job of getting them opened. I think uh, the decisions that were made going forward to have the staggered uh, start and uh, has, has been really good. Uh, uh, Mr. Ringstaff has done, and his team has done a, just a remarkable job making decisions under, I just can't imagine the amount of pressure that was, uh, that they were under uh, dealing with this and the loss of Dr. Gilbert, uh, just a lot of different things. So uh, the steady hand that they presented to the, te to the teachers and to the students has been remarkable. Uh, but the w ultimate decision was basically to post postpone or put a pause on the process of selecting the next permanent director of the Murfreesboro City Schools. That's basically a pause in that selection process. Now, they did spend uh, eleven five, I think it was, $11,500 with the Tennessee uh, School Board Association to help them, guide them through this selection process. They will not, last night, their executive director said they would not be an additional charge once they picked up that ball again to proceed with the selection of the permanent director of schools. So there, there's not, that money's not down the drain. Uh, the hope is that once they've gotten through this initial start and this unstable time uh, and had a steady hand on the wheel, basically, during that time, someone that everybody feels comfortable with, then they can proceed with the uh, process of selecting the permanent director of, of the city school system. Uh, it, it procedurally got difficult because they couldn't figure out how to get away from and, and build consensus. We've been there before. And so we ultimately just say, take a vote, and if you've got four votes, we'll go forward. And lots of times I think the prudent thing for us and other deliberative bodies in this crazy time is when you can't find consensus, it's okay to push pause, defer that, let those questions come to the front, uh, and then you end up making a better decision that's publicly uh, makes reasonable sense going forward. Last night, it it just got sideways, and, and we couldn't figure out a way to get us back on track. And so I, I'm hoping that we'll present that this is just the same thing as a deferral. It is putting the pause button on the uh, uh, progressing with the search, and and uh, they'll pick that ball up and move forward uh, in the short in short time once they be move through this kind of difficult time. Your time is up. Thank you. Was that enough? That's, Bill. Bill, thank you. Thank you for sitting. And you know, I know you're sitting in on that meeting, those meetings, and you don't have a vote. So uh, you're sitting there listening and relaying back. So that's a, a tough job sometimes when you when you really want to be able to say. <laughs> well, there's wonderful people. The yeah. thing is, the staff and the school board are are conscientious. 
people. And that's one thing I think we can we can rest assured yep. that they're trying to do the right thing and trying to find the most appropriate answer. Okay. Well, thank you for serving. Sure. Um, also want to congratulate um, newly uh, the uh, council member elect Sean Wright. So Sean is uh, will take office September one. Is that correct? So we'll have a swearing ceremony, um, swearing in ceremony, <laughs> not a swearing ceremony. Comes afterwards. Yeah, after at the in, uh, at the 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 uh, forums, or excuse me, at the rotunda. So, Craig, y'all have and, and Craig and, and Chief folks, I'm, I really want to make sure that all our staff member who are sitting out here, it is. I think Rick can agree with this too. From coaching soccer, you can always coach a kid down from being aggressive, but it's really hard to coach a kid to be aggressive. So I would always rather be reining our staff in from bringing suggestions to us instead of trying to push our staff to make suggestions. So I appreciate Chief folks and Craig and all of our staff for bringing us ideas that although they may be uncomfortable, um, sometimes when good ideas and change comes to you, it's un it is uncomfortable. So uh, I don't want our staff to ever stop challenging us and bringing us different things that um, we can look at. And the, the, the day that we stop doing that, that's the day that our city will start going backwards because we don't have good things come to us. So I just want to say thank you all for doing that. Um, Craig, are we meeting next Thursday? We will likely meet next Thursday. Yeah. Okay. And then the following Thursday, we'll see. Uh, as far as the swearing in, we may do that. We have a meeting on the third, so we might do it on the on the third yeah, before that, the meeting. Yeah, yeah. It, it probably be public comment, so we may do it. At, what's and public comment? I, I did six or six. I, I, I don't want to. But before that, I don't want to leave out um, Councilman Shacklett, uh, Councilman Wade, who also yeah, got swear too. were reelected and. Um, and also to, to thank uh, Councilman Smotherman for, uh, I guess next Thursday will be his his last meeting. So Eddie's been a uh, been a pleasure to work with for for almost eight years. Right. So, all right, we'll stand adjourned.